Uh, can we start? Oh, uh, yes. Greetings. This is IIRSI Intraocular Implant and Refractive Society of India webinar on capsular challenges on phaco emulsification. We have a very good audience right across South America, Central America, North America, Europe, Africa, Asia, and Australia. We would be taking care of dif different aspects of capsular challenges. So here, you know, what we would be, I would be sharing the initial video. see the video. I think it's paused. Share it again. We should share it again. You, you should play it again. It's it's paused. And try not to maximize it. Also, when sharing, you know, you have the option to stream it for video, like uh, optimize it for video. Just do that. Gaurav, welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have with I have with me uh, Dr. Gaurav Luthra, who would be moderating this session with me. He is from Drishti Eye Hospital. He's a worthy son of a worthy ophthalmologist, chairman of ARC IRSI, and he's only present in all webinars. Dr. Shruti would have been with me because of some uh, problems; she could not make it. Then we have with us Dr. Mahipal Sachdev, who is the president of AIOS. He's the chairman's scientific committee of IIRSI and who has always believed in changing before the change. He has been responsible for spearheading the very face of Indian ophthalmology. Then we have the strong lady in Indian ophthalmology, Dr. Namrata Sharma. She is the secretary of secretary AIOS and professor in ophthalmology art at RP Center, the Pinnacle Institute of Ophthalmology. Josh Biko is also with us. He's a dear friend, lecturer, University of Toronto. He's on the review panel of editorial boards of 10 ophthalmology journal and one of the premier surgeons of North America. John Hart, mm -hmm. thanks Biko for introducing to John Hart, who is a dear friend. Kim and John form an admirable couple. He's a very popular figure across the world from Michigan, US. Uh, and he has a great insight into funk. He has won so many awards in AICRS. Then we have our own Partha Biswas. He's the chairman scientific committee and he's of AIOS and director at BBI Foundation Kolkata. Dr. Dhami, a very close friend. He's the president of IIRSI, director Dhami Eye Care Hospital. And then we have Deepak Megu, who has excellent videos, great insight, and he is at the Cataract and Glaucoma Services, Magur Eye Care Center, Bidar, Karnataka, India. Dr. Rajinder Prasad is also there with us. He's the director of Rajinder Prasad Eye Institute, New Delhi, India, and Joshua Young, who everybody is familiar with because he's taking interviews left, right, and center. He's the clinical, a clinical professor in, at Langone Health Teach Hospital, New York, US. So we would be dealing with different aspects. So the first would be, uh, you know, the video has been played. The first is, the, the video has to be played again. Rohit, you missed out two, three people. Dr. Lisa. Rohit? Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. Well, the faculty will be, the speakers will be introduced afterwards. 
so as and okay. how we will go into it so the first talk is going to be so dr tushya is sharing the video can you see the video now the volume is not there <clears throat> Sound. Sound is not working. Dr. Tushya, you have muted it. Mute, mute. Dr. Tushya has muted it. so we will start with the first talk which will be taken up by professor chi soon fake so she would be talking on capsular challenges so she is she has she has over 200 peer reviewed scientific papers and books uh, in chap and uh, book chapters so over to dr chi so good evening to everyone around the world I want to thank the IRSI for kindly inviting me to participate in this uh, webinar. So I've been asked to talk about how to do capsulitis in cases of severe zonulitis. So in these cases, sometimes it can be difficult to initiate the capsulitis, and we may need a twin seven gauge needle to initiate. Make sure that the incisions are very snug, and I usually do not do my main incision until I've done the capsulitis. So initially, after puncturing the capsule rectus, you want to actually support as well as uh, grasp the capsule so that you provide the counterforce for tearing. Because in cases of severe zonulitis, more than 180 degrees, uh, usually you know you have no choice where you have to start, and you may not be in a good position to have the zonules that are currently intact uh, support your rectus as you tear. So in order to provide the support, I usually use a micro grasper to grasp the capsule. So I grasp and the red one is actually what is actively moving. So I grasp it, and the other uh, instrument is a capsule rectus forceps, which I start to use to tear to grasp the edge and to tear. And as I do that, I then change the capsule rectus forceps to a micro grasper to provide the support, so it doesn't tear the capsule as it supports the capsule. And then hand over hand between the two instruments. I go around and do the capsule rectus. These are the instruments which I use. All right, I use a MST micro grasper and a Kawai capsule rectus forceps from Asiko, and I have no financial interest in anything which I'll be talking about. So this is a case of severe zonulitis following trauma, sports injury, and you'll see that the lens is relatively clear. It's in a 50 over year old gentleman, and the lens is actually in the anatomical position. There's no vitreous there, but you can see it coming on the side. So you make sure that there's no vitreous when you do your capsular rectus. If there is and it's coming across the anterior capsule, you need to deal with that first. All right. So you see, I've initiated the capsular rectus with a capsular rectus micro forceps, and then I grasp the capsule edge. Now I've changed my instrument uh, to a micro grasper. Okay, so that it's not sharp, and you then provide the counterforce hand over hand. Okay, so you hold on to one because there are no zonules here. You then tear with the other, and so what are you looking at for their guidance? How do you know how big your rectus is? Basically, you look at the equator for that guidance. All right, you can see all these anterior capsule folds because of the absence of the uh, zonular support. All right, this is actually completely absent, maybe only for a few in this area here. All right, near the the incision uh, which I'm using, and basically uh, you you need to provide counterforce all around. 
Okay, so you see that we are completing the rectus now, and it's only when you've completed the rectus, then do you start to transfer the support right, to other uh, devices, like a capsular bag hook, which you see me introducing, and, and you can see this is the area where the vitreous is herniating forward, and if you bring that forward, you provide the support because that phase is not interrupted. You can basically uh, do without the checkpoint. Right, so this is in the iris plane. Now, how about this case? You can see I'm indenting uh, superiorly here, all right, to get that uh, capsule, uh, that, that lens seen. And then with the 27 gauge needle, I then spear it and bring it forward, all right? So you have to grasp the edge that you have slit. And then this is the capsule axis forceps, which is initiating the tear. And I'm supporting with my micro grasper. So you must have one instrument on the capsule at all times. And you see I have my hooks already positioned. They're very, very snug incisions so that I don't lose switches. But in this case, I had already done a vitrectomy uh, going from the past planar approach. All right, so if you have an iris hook supporting uh, the anterior capsule edge, uh, that provides the counter force. So in this case here, you see that I did not have to introduce the second instrument. But again, when I come round, Zonules here are weak and will not be able to provide the adequate counter force for me to control the rexus direction and size. So before you tear, you grasp so that it can actually tear exactly the correct direction and the correct size. Because if you don't, it will tend to run out towards the equator because the lens tends to be globular when you do not have the support provided by the rexus, the tension on the anterior capsule. So you can see uh, that's a patient that's hinged. I'm going to show you the third case now. It's a bit more challenging because this is tilting backwards and there's some vitreous which, you know, we're removing years ago. All right. So I have to aspirate. I was worried. I used the uh, capsular dye stain to stain. And I was very cautious because I didn't want to stain the vitreous, which you well can do, all right, if you are uh, uh, not careful. So I'm putting a 27 gauge needle to initiate the rectus as well as aspirate to decompress this uh, intermittent lens. Now, some of you may be worried about Argentinian flex, and I can assure you, you will practically never have uh, Argentinian flex line in such a case because it's the zonules that pull on the anterior capsule that make that capsule taut. So, in the absence of uh, this, you know, the tension from the anterior uh, on the anterior capsule by the zonules, actually, you can safely puncture this. I mean, I've done a few of these uh, subluxated lenses where it's intermittent and the, the lens capsule. You know, it's something that you would be worried about puncturing because of Argentina flex side, but you don't really have to worry because it's not actually pulled tautly because the zonules are actually gone in this case. Okay, so again, we do a hand over hand and I'm providing the support uh, where I can with iris hooks. And then when necessary, then I would put out the second instrument to help. In this case, this was done like 15 years ago. I merely used uh, iris hooks to help me. So, you know, if you feel very uncomfortable about using your, your other hand to come in and, you know, a biomanual kind of capsule, you can have hooks that help you to provide the necessary support. I'm going to show you one last case. Now, this is a different case scenario. This is a Marfan's uh, syndrome in a 17-year-old. So this lens, unlike the rest, is not actually shifted. It's actually misshapen. So it's a small lens, and you do not want to the, do the rexis very big and far across superiorly from the screen here because it's not that the equator superiorly is far out, all right? It's actually an oval-shaped lens because the zonules here have actually become very lax and stretched. And so I'm going to create an oval capsule rexis. Now, I don't always use hooks unless the pupil is small. In this case, the, the pupil was a little uh, smaller than I would have preferred, liked it, so I used some iris hooks to show me a bit more of the capsule. You can see I'm providing the counterforce with my micro grasper, and you can use that grasp to actually pull the, the uh, capsule, the, the lens more into view. All right, now what you see is a valuable tip that you can transfer from hand to hand, because sometimes as the capsule gets folded up, you lose view of where you are tearing. Right, so when you transfer from hand to hand, you never lose the edge of the capsule, like what you're seeing here. Okay, so this is just to show you uh, for a Marfan's, and you can see the size, all right, the size of the rexis is uh, really quite optimal in this case. So in conclusion, bimanual capsule rexis is needed when the zonular loss is severe, 
all right? And you know it when you initiate it, all right? There's no counterforce, there's severe uh, capsular folds and pseudo-elasticity. So this is only performed because uh, after you've got the lens restored to the anatomical position. So that's a very important step, right? Bring it to the correct position to be centered as well as uh, vertically into the right position. And the lack of counter-traction for capsule axis results in pseudo-elasticity, like what you saw here. Uh, you know, the lens spinning along as you try to pull. You definitely need to then take a second instrument, or you can use an iris hook there to provide the counter-force. All right, non-tooth micrograspers actually are used to grip the capsule rim to provide the counter-force uh, as, as well as stabilizing grip. And you do a hand over hand in the absence of the, the support of the zonules. And we look to the equator for our guidance during the CCC in order to get that round capsule axis or appropriate shape, as in the Marfan's case, and also the correct size. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Chi. I think uh, it was an ultimately fabulous uh, presentation. So I have one question to ask. Uh, why do you prefer iris hooks over capsular hooks? Okay, so, you know, they are for different uh, purposes. So sometimes in cases like this, I would use both iris hooks as well as capsule hooks. So in order to provide the counter force, I prefer to use an iris hook because it's shape is such that it's just uh, parallel to the capsule edge rather than dipping deeper into the uh, capsular bag. Okay, so once I've actually provided a counterforce just on the rim of the capsule, I then switch to capsular bag hooks, which are different because they are much longer and they actually support the equator of the capsule. So that's important when you're doing FACO. In fact, I prefer to insert a capsule tension ring right at the outstart after completing the rexis because that actually supports the equator better because it's not just at the points where your capsule hooks are in contact with the equator. I think what you show makes us believe that even dreams can be reality. Dr. Mahipal, uh, your take on it, are you, uh, what would you say about it? Do you use flax and how would you go with the flax to what extent what Dr. Professor Chi has shown? So actually what she has shown is uh, in case you don't have the femtolaser uh, capsulotomy available with you because uh, uh, the lack of elasticity or uh, a subluxation or even a mild vitreous coming into the interior chamber on top of the capsule does not obviate the use of a femtolaser. The advantage of a femtolaser is that you could actually have the capsulotomy customized uh, to center it where it should be once the le uh, once the capsule comes back to the center. You can have it pupil maximized, you can have it centered on the pupil, you can have it centered on the uh, limbus or you can do it manually. So that is something uh, which is uh, which gives you the flexibility. I think in subluxated cataracts, etc. Femtolaser, uh, Professor Chi also uses that. That gives you uh, that actually uh, you don't have to dream to get a capsule out me uh, like uh, Professor Chi does because I think she is one of the best surgeons in the world and uh, not ev everyone is a like us mortals are not equivalent to what she does but I think obviously the basic principles are fantastic because there is a loss of support on one area and you have to get traction counter traction and hand over hand uh, techniques as she has shown. But I think femtolaser obviates that and I think uh, for a common or a ophthalmologist who does have a femto, a uh, lot of these problems would be solved by using a femto for doing a capsulotomy in such cases. So, so can I just uh, say that, you know, for example, the first case, I actually put him under the femto, all right? Yeah. And then he jerked his eye and the whole lens just shifted off. Okay, it will, because these cases that I'm showing you with bimanual capsulitis are cases of severe zonulitis. Some of them are tipping into the vitreous, which makes it far too deep for the uh, imaging of the capsulitis to be performed properly. It's tilted, you know, and it's, it's going too far into the mid vitreous for the laser to actually access. So I, I do use the femto laser. I agree completely. I love the laser where it can actually access the, the uh, lens, but in severe cases like what I've shown you very often, it's not possible. I, I'll agree with you in severe cases, obviously it would not be possible because uh, obviously there will be in, uh, uh, the planes would be very different between the top part and the bottom part. That I agree 100%, but majority of the times uh, we get partial subluxations or subluxations that can be handled, but 
again a person uh, needs to be very deft at doing these things i would rather go in and remove the lens in uh, say subluxated and go in for a scleral fixated blue dye or or something like that so that uh, depends on the individual but obviously your surgical skills are par excellence and uh, i think uh, the points that you have raised are uh, uh, the basic principles are fantastic and uh, uh, i think great videos and as uh, rohit said uh, dreams would come true everyone will have hands like you and a brain like you <laughs> thank uh, you george your what your your comments on this i think dr lisa wants to say something yeah so if i may just briefly say uh i published a paper with uh boris malyugin where he actually put his ring in and then uh used a hook to uh use it like a picture frame and center it on the lens cutting off the hook and then using the femto which uh was a feat uh that allows you know uh, uh to do a decentered lens with the femto laser if that is your preference if you can uh you do need a liquid interface uh to do that well i believe okay yeah so now i would be uh, i also wanted to say something parth sir yeah yes sir uh uh professor chi um, i really congratulate you on the wonderful teaching videos that you have had and i've used your technique in five cases the first three cases were utter failures i absolutely failed and my first hand ripped the capsule to the end and i had a rip and uh, i had to abort that case and do a lensectomy vitrectomy and then a, a scleral fixated iol but the next two i what i realized is the tip of the forceps have to be very very atraumatic and i got one of our local manufacturers do it uh, so that it was uh, not a very sharp tip and it was very atraumatic and uh, the next two i got it but obviously they were not as circular as yours but i could carve the rexus with the two forceps that you have shown hand in hand so i think it's a wonderful technique and especially if femto is not available and uh, it can work but it definitely needs a lot of practice but in well done here in severe subluxations like dr chi showed the last case manually doing it is more you know more customizable as compared to femto and you may not be able to do femto in extreme subluxation which is just jump to you know one side and you can't center it also because how far will you go because the lens is only half of it only can be seen so i think it's a great technique uh, in those kind of cases thank you i think uh, we should uh, move ahead now so the next is going to be my talk so yes. i would be uh, talking about uh, intumescent cataracts and uh, uh, five intumescent Dr. Roy, will allow me to introduce you for a moment <laughs> yeah please <sir. laughs> that's my pleasant duty so mm -hmm. you know he is always the modest uh, kind who will not want to be introduced but all the same uh, and yes he does not need an introduction uh, dr rohit om prakash Uh, has been uh, instrumental he's been a fantastic peco surgeon i have emulated him uh, over the last 20 years that uh, i've been seeing him uh, do his amazing uh, peco techniques he's a brilliant teacher and um, he has uh, to his credit you know several publications several new techniques the flap motility sign amongst them being the most uh, you know uh, popular one and he has uh, been uh, you know uh, organizing these irsi winter conferences in amritsar which is the city of the golden temple and uh, they have been outstanding conferences uh, every year in january and we all look forward to these uh, meetings every year now uh, with that small introduction although they can be lots i'll request dr rohit to please uh, speak on his uh, uh you know intumescent cataracts and fibrotic uh, capsules uh thank you thanks dr gorov so i would be taking up intumescent cataracts well the biggest challenge with these intumescent cataracts is the capsular excess because all that we want to do is that we want to prevent the argentinian flag sign well the diagnosis of these fluid filled pearly white intumescent cataracts can be ascertained by the lens thickness wherein there is an increased anterior posterior diameter subsequent to which the anterior chamber depth gets decreased slit lamp examination is also to be done biometry when we do we see that there are two or three spikes between the l1 and l2 uh, uh, spikes and as far as the oct is concerned as abhinav dhami has already elucidated that you see those 
fluid filled pockets so these are the way how you can really diagnose these uh, you know intumescent cataracts we have to realize that there are basically two compartments in the lens the interior compartment and the posterior compartment and these are all high pressurized highly pressurized compartments so and the next important thing is that we have a you know the pressure from behind also this pressure from behind is also relevant in many cases because for that at times we have to use intravenous mannitol the pressure from the lids is also to be is also very important which we need to take care of so that can be as chi always says that you use the jaffe speculum which produces the least amount of pressure on the globe anterior chamber pressure is also very important for which you know what we have to do is that we have to increase and equalize the pressure in the anterior chamber so how do we do that by act, by adding a visco cohesive in the anterior chamber so when we add the visco cohesive what we are trying to do is we are uh, is it clear now is it clear hello yes hello? it is very much yeah so but so, uh, so this increases and equalizes the pressure in the anterior chamber so this visco cohesive so now when in my practice what i do is that if the anterior chamber depth is less than 2.3 mm i use a 30 gauge needle aspiration so what i do is that 30 gauge needle goes in and it and that is the time when you know simultaneously you have to aspirate it this simultaneous aspiration creates a situation where we have a concavity in the center so this is another video just to show that the concavity you know the moment i'm taking time to set my hand on the plunger because the moment i go in i have to aspirate it and this aspiration once done uh, uh, takes care of the you know the high intralenticular pressure which is inside so now with this done what is left with is that we have a high intralenticular uh, pressure in the mid periphery so now what we have to do is we create a small central ccc so this small central ccc takes care of not going into the mid periphery so you will see now what i do is that once that is done through the micro forceps you go in and complete the central small capsular axis so this central small capsular axis is done so the next step now is you know when you have to make an incision make a partial incision so this partial incision makes you go through with a micro forceps and with the with a visco cohesive so that there is no sudden decrease of pressure inside the anterior chamber next is if the anterior chamber depth by any means is more than 2.3 mm in my practice you know we are all talking about initiating the rexis i believe that you have to give a direction to the rexis initiation because if you give a linear initiation that can create a situation wherein it can extend right up to the periphery so a central curved initiation is very important so that helps next what we have started doing nowadays is the reverse angled initiation this reverse angled initiation helps you in the sense once you make that reverse uh, angled initiation it comes directly under your view even if you have to struggle since it's directly under your view the flap will not extend to the periphery it will not have a predisposition to extend to the periphery so this is another thing which we note to do you will see the bouncing this bouncing shows that there's a lot of intralenticular pressure which needs to be taken care of next part is we have taken care of the central part so this part has a high intralenticular pressure the next thing which we do is as she says you do the milking so from the periphery and the next step is once you have done the milking you have to do debulking to take care of the posterior compartment so let's see how it is being done so once you introduce that so this is the milking which is being done which takes care of the high intralenticular pressure which is there in the mid periphery you can see how it is the it is coming to the center so that takes care of the high it is done the capsular axis becomes simple and you can very well continue as if it's a normal case without any problem whatsoever so you'll see how the capsular axis is being completed in a normal fashion 
So this done, next is, you know, you can use the YAG laser and injected it there. It would have extended to the periphery. So that is what needs to be taken care of. So in this video, I would like you to see, you will find that there are four problems which are there, which are causing it to extend. First, there is, it's a viscodispersive, large incision. You know, you see how I'm pressing it. So this pressure on the anterior capsule is also very important. You should have a pointed tip also and a micro calibrated forceps. So once at times, these the Argentinian flag sign, you know, despite everything, it still occurs. So a small thing, this flap motility sign, if you find that the flap is averted and fluttering, you will see that triple view stain. It means it is pre-equatorial. And if it becomes inverted, it means it is post-equatorial. So in that case, you have to extend, you have to convert. If you don't convert, you will end up with a nucleus prop. With this, you can implant the IOL in the back if the flap is fluttering and averted. Flax is something which is also there. You'll find in these intumescent cataracts, you'll, you'll see a volcanic eruption. In this, you know, video, so you have to move in a more diligent way. In these white cataracts, despite everything, you, you know, you feel that you, you, you will find that there is partial fragmentation. So this makes phaco emulsification very easy all the way. So this is a fibrotic cataract with subcapsular. So in these subcapsular plaques, which appear in white cataracts, you have to be very careful. So what you, what the scheme of things is that you plaque and you complete the rexis central to, then comes the second part. Second part is you have to die, you with dissection, you have to separate the subcapsular plaque. So you'll see how the subcapsular plaque has to be separated. This is basically Deepak Magur's idea. And he showed it in a beautiful video in ESCRS, which won the prize in, a, in our AIOS also. You have to totally dissect it from all sides. The plaque is not fully separated. So separate it and take out the subcapsular plaque. Once that subcapsular plaque is taken out, another one I think I should hold it because in this, you know, the cleavage plane has gated to, uh, you know, uh, so once this small rexis is over, go around and then you have to dissect it. I'm not showing the dissection because I showed it extensively in the last video. So, you know, you have to just wriggle it out and separate it so that you end up with a situation wherein you have that central plaque out, the cap subcapsular plaque out, and then the capsular rexis can be completed. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Rohit, for those amazing, uh, fantastic uh, all the way from Canada. And uh, George, uh, how do you, uh, would you do anything differently for the intumescent cataracts than what uh, Dr. Rohit said? Would you like to add any pearls on that? Like Then what he does is once I have my capsular rexis, um, rather than use a tip to milk the um, liquid from the mid periphery or from behind, um, put out that way. Um, you know, I'm not the same thing. The thing is just to be jetting us. Um, I've had situations where I've had that, and your initial uh, reaction is to go in and you try and see if you can use the phaco tip to remove that plaque. And it, it does show that you have to remove that manually before you go in and do your phaco emulsification. So I think that's a very important point. Thanks, thanks, George. In fact, you know, when I was seeing him do that milking, I was like, very very uh, you know i was scared that you might just break the capsule so is there a special instrument that you use for that dr ruit uh, like uh, to stroke it because you know i would be worried in an intumescent cataract uh, trying to stroke uh, the cannula which i use uh, you know we should not be very much worried about uh, you know this into this interior capsule in intumescent cataract because this has the same thickness as it is there in the normal cataracts so don't be overly you know protective about the uh, you know, anterior capsule, because if you, even if you do it, stroke it, it will not, because you, when you're doing it, you know, you are not creating a pressure. With that pressure, the fluid is being directed towards the center. So it will not make any difference whatsoever. Right, thanks. You know, so in the hands of a master surgeon, I think he knows exactly how mm -hmm. much pressure he's using and everything. Dr. Dhami, sir, you have been, uh, your center has innovated for intumescent cataracts and you've published on OCT use for intumescent. Can you share like quickly? Yeah, uh, Rohit, uh, very well demonstrated. But uh, we, 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 as you see on the entire segment OCT, you do get pockets. 
and you can really realize how many pockets are behind the nucleus of the fluid and like uh, dr biko said it's just rocking the nucleus to break those pockets and immediately the fluid will be uh, will be grasping out and you have a complete flat uh, anterior capsule on back to the nucleus great thanks sir so, so, so the oct is quite an innovative thing on the fl uh, femtosecond platform as well as you know stand alone before you do the surgery you can do the oct to check these pockets as uh, abhinav dhami has uh, described and before we go on i think i'll take deepak megor who's who's you know who had these award winning mm -hmm. films and uh, you know would you like to chip in with few pearls uh, for these uh, fibrotic uh, cataracts and how you remove those things uh, from under the capsule deepak are you there i think uh, i don't see deepak there uh, i'll but take uh, I, is deepak there i just want to make one comment no, yes dr namrata yes so i was saying what dr dhami sir has said i think makes a real sense if you see it on a intra opacity microscope and i think i've said that earlier also and i do have videos of what dr rohit om prakash uh, is saying that if you actually make a small rexus first you can actually see the release of the fluid which is you know much more controlled as opposed to if you have a argentinian flap and it just kind of gushes out which is more abrupt so you can actually visualize it there and you can, if you see those black areas in in the center of your white cataract on the intrap oct microscope then you know that it is not going to the fluid is not going to come out which i think uh, dr dhami sir is also you know pointing towards but if you don't have that then you know that it is definitely going to yeah. come out uh, yeah. yeah i'm there Am I audible? Yes. I'm audible. Am I audible? Yes, Deepak. Oh, Just yes, talk Deepak. for a moment. I'm going to ask you something. <clears throat> that it makes sense, you know, to do a small rexus and then to make a big one because of the controlled way the intraventricular pressure is released, as opposed to the uh, abrupt way it would otherwise. Thanks, Namrata. In fact, you know, we'll look forward in case at the end of the show, if you have that video with you, we'll see. Just, like just, not right now, but like if we have time at the end of the program, we can do that. And uh, Deepak, we were uh, missing you. Uh, Dr. Deepak Megur has, uh, as Dr. Rohit said, uh, you know, shown amazing videos. So I don't know whether you saw Dr. Rohit. Uh, you were missing for a while. So did you manage to see Dr. Rohit Prakash's last case where he showed those, you know, how to remove those subcapsular fibrotic uh, membranes? So I was going to ask you for any pearl because we are running short of time, and then we quickly. Go on to the next presentation so would you like to chip in with any one or two pearls that you might want to share uh, with our viewers uh, deepak uh, dr deepak megur can you hear me i think he can't hear me uh, anyway so i think we'll come back to okay. him later so uh, dr can i just have a very one brief yes, com yes, one comment yes, yes, i you i find gray shaver small scissors to cut these fibrotic plaques from okay. different ergonomically suited small incisions very useful and a two stage capsulotomy and rexis were suggested by dr gimbel in early 90s so i think you know i think those are amazing we roy it made uh, a great teaching videos thank you roy absolutely and i i agree with you oh, completely i do use these micro scissors myself as well uh, dr rohit uh, you wanted to say something yeah uh, lisa wants to say something sure sure ma'am thank you i just briefly i think this is the one valid reason for using helon 5 if you have that accessible because the whole point is just to have the pressure in the chamber greater than the pressure in the lens and so when you make a small opening and you continue and you and you have that nicely filled you you see a very slow egress of fluid and it's another approach uh, excellent tips are dr lisa and uh, yes uh, john you wanted to chip in yeah quick one last one yeah yeah just real quick the the idea of keeping the pressure higher in the inner chamber is really important there was actually a video at the ASCRS where somebody used an anterior chamber maintainer and worked through small incisions so that the pressure inside the anterior chamber was always higher instead of using a viscoelastic or anything else really inexpensive really easy way to get around the argentine flag sign um so that's something to consider Thank, thanks john uh, that that's a nice tip as well and uh, for for me the take home was close chamber enter from a paracentesis at the limbus that's what i like to do and i saw dr rohit do that as well for me that makes sure that the chamber is nice and tight but all these things can be useful and dr lisa tips so i think um, you know so that we don't fall behind time i'll go on to invite our next speaker and uh, none other than uh, dr abhay vasavada whom i'm sure everybody in india and abroad knows he's been one of the pioneers he's been the face of indian ophthalmology uh, all over the 
you know world and uh, you know an introduction for him is uh, very difficult to make yet i would like to chip in with a few things he was only the second asian to be awarded the bing cost uh, medic medal lecture by the ascrs in 2011 uh, he is on the power list of global ophthalmology which is like one of the biggest list and there are very few indians there uh, he is one of them he was awarded the bc roy award which is given it's a award given by the indian government it's one of the most coveted awards not given only to ophthalmologists but from across the spectrum of uh, medical uh, specialists so getting this is uh, really a big honor he also had the american academy of ophthalmology's achievement award in 2005 more or more than all these things he's been a great teacher to all of us with all his pearls about pediatric cataracts and everything now i won't hold him uh, back any more uh, dr vasavada sir please go ahead thank you gaurav so nice so kind uh, this is my financial interest and i recognize the contribution of my team on this topic uh, uh, restoring the capsule ozonular complex in advanced chronic angle closure glaucoma and angle closure glaucoma typically has a narrow anterior segment and there is very little uh, rotation of the ciliary body in a typical angle closure situation as you would see here uh, the ciliary body has this very well in a normal orientation and therefore uh, uh, conventional cataract surgery putting a lens in the back works very well uh, most of the time <clears throat> However, if the chronic angle closure process is advanced, uh, there is an additional element of the anatomy change, and that is the forward rotation of the ciliary body. And, and the, the, this can be measured now very precisely, the anterior rotation of the ciliary body, and that can give you an indication of the severity of the narrowness of this anterior segment. Now, uh, there is a total forward bulge, and if you put in such an eye in the bag, conventional IOL, sometimes it doesn't work, and uh, this didn't work in my one first eye of a patient where the entire IOL remained uh, forward like the original cataract, and the angle was very small, and uh, I really had to repeat a procedure. Now, now we believe that this forward rotation is because of the a lack of uh, zonular and capsular back support uh, of these lens, uh, which could both of the ciliary body rotation or uh, or a primary event. And I recognize Dr. Kumar Doctor here, who really made a, a award-winning video this time in ASCRS on zonular and zonulopathy. Uh, and uh, it's it's the capsular zonular weakness which rotates the ciliary body. We believe. And it leads to the <clears throat> possibility of malignant glaucoma and continuous of the uh, shallow chamber. So I think thinking out of the bag uh, is it's very important now. And at this stage, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of uh, Dr. Tom Tobias Noyan, Dr. Gimbel, Dr. Lisa Arbizer, Rupert, uh, Jason, Thomas Uting, and Mary Jose, and many others who have really worked on these thinking out of the bag, what it means is that putting the lens outside the bag or supporting the lens outside the bag, that means putting the haptic on the front of the anterior capsule after creating about four to 4.5 millimeter posterior capsule axis, uh, just underneath the iris in front of the anterior capsule and then capturing this optic through both anterior and posterior capsular axis. So the, the haptic actually supported uh, at the ciliary sulcus and giving a great stability to the entire IOL. And the IOL is actually locked between the two fused intercapsule, which is an additional advantage of uh, preventing central posterior capsule axis. So this second eye of that patient where we had the problem in the first eye, I, I did this technique, doing a axis, placing the haptic in front of the anterior capsule, and then uh, capturing through both the anterior capsule axis. This technique uh, is a little difficult, but uh, like ma many of these newer techniques, if you, if you focus on it and uh, uh, pass through learning curve, it's, it's not that difficult. It's, it's very easily reproducible. And this is 
typical scenario where you can see the IOL sitting behind and the and the very nice open angle with with a great distance between the uveal tissue and the IOL. And the same patient preoperatively, if you see the anteriorly rotated ciliary body uh, versus the post op, which is now uh, a different uh, anatomy. So, in other words, uh, the possibility of malignant glaucoma or a persistence of the narrowness of the intersegment following cataract surgery is easily avoidable or avoided time after time uh, in this situation. You can see the, uh, the rotation of the ciliary body and surely now going back here, a lot of space here. And, and, and you can demonstrate in all the amazing technology convincingly the space created. The, but the best part is that here uh, the IOL uh, and the capsular bag complex is actually supported by the haptics in the ciliary sulcus. So you don't need to depend on the loose uh, capsular bag zonal complex. This is different than putting the entire three-piece lens in the sulcus, which is a conventional way of doing it. And we have done many. We repented it several times by putting single piece acris off and many others. But, but here, opposed to that, here, because of that angulation and the posterior uh, pressure exerted, the fused capsules lock the lens and, and really create a very safe distance with very stable IOL uh, in that situation. Uh, Dr. Samresh Srivatsu, my colleague, has uh, demonstrated it in a Miyake view how stable these captured optic with both the axis and haptics and sulcus remain uh, after the surgery. So I think uh, we need to change our perspective uh, in thinking out of the bag. Uh, and, and once again, I, I, I salute my senior faculty and colleagues from whom we have learned all throughout. But this technique is not that difficult to perform. Particularly if you have a long standing advanced angle closure glaucoma, you can rest assured you will not have a malignant glaucoma or, a, or a, any change, uh, uh, persistent change in the shallow chamber. You will always restore it. And I would recommend for your consideration. Uh, this concept and this approach, which is nothing new, but it is one more application of this uh, wonderful concept of, of capturing through both rexes with haptic and ciliary sulcus. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thanks, uh, Dr. Vasavadasa, for that uh, fantastic presentation. And we do remember the nice uh, award-winning videos uh, on the optic capture. I have a quick question for the panelists after this, but first uh, one question from you. And uh, in these uh, angle closure or chronic uh, long-standing, uh, uh, you know, narrow angle glaucomas, would you also have find any difficulty in doing a primary posterior rexis and maybe expect some kind of vitreous disturbance more often than not? And uh, would it be really so important to do the posterior rexis uh, rather to, you know, just do a posterior capture of the anterior capsule? This is just a thought and I'm sure you have- a No, no, I think this is very, very relevant and very, very useful thing. I think I did seven cases so far. And the first case I, I had to abandon because I did it in a topical. So you need a controlled peribulbar anesthesia. And once you have the control, the anterior vitreous disruption or disturbance is, is practically non-existent. But if you only capture through anterior capsule in such angle closure, uh, it still will be the same because what we really need is the pressure of this angulated concept on both this capsule, but importantly on the zonules, so that it mechanically will push and it will work like a debulking of the anterior vitreous, as you will find. Uh, in anti-vitrectomy for malignant glaucoma. It does the same trick like a vitrectomy of a bulking by pressurizing it, but without doing anti-vitrectomy. Fantastic. Fantastic. I have a question Sorry. for uh, Dr. Vasavada Gaurav. Yes, I remember uh, when you had described this technique for optic capture in pediatric cataract uh, cases, uh, and there it was done with and without an anterior vitrectomy. You said that the uh, reaction is more in the anterior chamber. The, the AC reaction was more in those cases where capture was done, vis-a-vis -vis where capture was not done. So do you, do you think that it is still, uh, it, it, does it still hold 
true in cases of adults uh, when you are doing it for angle clitoral glaucoma? I think what you're referring is correct. We did publish that, but later on we realized that it is IOL design and material dependent and the size of the Rex. So we then published a report where we did not find increased inflammation, but your point is correct. Professor Namrata, it can happen. So if you have a good viscoelastic closed chamber technique and all the principles which you are learning from our stalwarts, that's not an issue, I believe. Thanks. Even sir, in this sir. scenario. Thank you, sir. I have two quick comments from two panelists and then I'll hand over to Dr. Rohit for the next speaker. I see that Josh Young has been wanting to say something and uh, he's <laughs> crossed his mind. And I'll ask him and then I'm going to ask Dr. Rajinder Prashad to chip in before we go on to the next uh, talk. So please, uh, yes, be ready to uh, Professor. Uh -huh. Yeah, can, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Because yes, I don't think my yes. Okay. So first of all, that was a absolutely absolutely beautiful video. It was really really um, wonderful. Uh, I am um, much less experienced than I suspect that some of you guys are with doing posterior capsulorexis, and I want to follow on the 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 question that 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 Gaurav just asked. Um, in in the event that that uh, that I want to to simply do capture through a a, a very conservative anterior capsule rexus without violating the the posterior capsule, is there any sense in putting in a capsular tension ring to put the the, the posterior capsule on greater uh, stretch, sort of like a, a a a drum head, so that I have a larger diaphragm to push posteriorly? Oh, I, I don't think so. Uh, the, the capsule ring will stretch the posterior capsule, as you said, and will, will remove the posterior capsule striae. But what we are looking for is a push or a pressure on the entire bag capsule zonal complex, both the capsule, the anterior, the equatorial, the posterior, and the zonal complex. So I think uh, anterior capsule capture will have some impact, but uh, really I would think this is uh, uh, not the best thing. Thanks, sir. And a quick comment from Dr. Prasad, and then I have a question for like uh, all the panelists for but one quick one. Yes. Dr. Rajendra Prasad, you have to unmute yourself, please. Yes, please. Yes. Well, it was an excellent presentation from Dr. Vasavara because uh, no doubt, uh, beautiful presentation. I have just a uh, very small uh, comment. Uh, like since the whole iris lens and the the, uh, the zonular diaphragm was forward in your first case, what you showed. So is there any possibility of doing the posterior decompression? Because it could be the vitreous, which is pushing them forward. So why not to do the vitreous decompression by doing a partial anterior vitrectomy from the past planar root or so? so I think it's a, it's, it's a very good valid option. And I've done it in the past, but with this, you you can get away with the vitrectomy. The whole idea is that you don't need vitrectomy if that happens and you can avoid the consequences of anti-vitrectomy and disturbance. But but your point is correct and I accept that. That was a wonderful point, Dr. Prasad. So I think we're going to go on, but before we go on, uh, okay, Partha, very quick one and then I have a, okay, and then George wants to say something. Okay, Partha. Uh, Vasudha said, uh, excellent video and uh, an excellent co uh, concept that you have floated. So one question that I would like to ask is, did you study the angle of the anterior chamber after doing the, uh, in the post-operative view? Meaning, uh, because these are angle closure glaucomas and uh, which are chronic, so the amount of adhesion that would have taken place, uh, would it, it would uh, persist, would it not? I mean, uh, yes, that's... Yes. Uh, I think that that's very true. We, we, you're right. We have been uh, following with all the imaging technology possible, including the angle examination or gonioscopy, anterior segment, OCT, UBM, all the stuff. The actual plastering of that, so the, depending on the function of the trabecular meshwork now, the IOP will then, but, but eight or more up of the 10 cases, it works well. But Radhi, you're right. It can never. On what Dr. Partha said, um, I have a fantastic video. Uh, if you look at your UBMs, you can see that the whole bag IOL complex goes back, but the iris still seems to be anterior and blocking the, the uh, angle. So my approach to these cases is not only to remove the cataract and put the IOL and have that complex go back, but to address the angle. So I'll do a gonial sinicolysis. And then I'll also do a pupil plasty because that iris is very flaccid. It's lost all of its 
Uh, usually it's lost all of its uh, musculature. And if you don't do a pupillaplasty, it'll come back up. So um, do you have any comments about that, whether or not yes, you address that? That's, not that's a very good thing. thing. And uh, I would definitely consider, but so far uh, of the cases I did seven, I didn't need to do that. IOP remained uh, quite within control, sometimes with the drops, sometimes without it. But but definitely pupilloplasty, mechanical stretching out would do. But even if you open up the angle, the talking, it is functioning. You may open anatomically angle, but is it going to function to drain? That's a question. So I don't think uh, pupilloplasty and uh, all these things uh, would work in this uh, such an advanced situation that we are referring to. But but I would consider that definitely. That's a, that's a great point. Thanks, Dr. Vasada. Dr. Rohit said, I think we should go ahead uh, with the next one. Let, well, I have the honor of, uh, you know, best teachers for complex PECO surgeries. And, uh, and in the peer voted CRST1, she was the top 50. Hello. Can you hear me? She, yeah. she, yes. Yeah, she we was, can hear she you. Top, she was the top 50 opinion leaders in cataract surgery. And she got the innovators in premium lens surgery worldwide award. So she and Ame were, they, you know, they formed an ophthalmological <laughs> couple and formed a unique way of retiring in 2013. I have heard so many instruction courses of hers and I'm a great fan of hers. She would be speaking on PCR, what next? I'd like to say what an honor it is to be included and uh, I'm very difficult to follow my incredible friend and mentors, uh, particularly Dr. Vasavada. And I'm, I'm almost cheerful that, that you've taken this concept, you know, which, which I've been pushing since about 2015 and, uh, and really realize the, the true, you know, at least one of the values of it. Uh, so um, I'd like to uh, just go ahead with my slideshow and I have voiced over a lot of it. So it, hopefully it will go very smoothly. Um, I have no relevant uh, financial uh, 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 declaration to make. So when we have a PCR uh, and uh, we break the capsule, the key is to recognize it as soon as possible to limit damage. And then additionally, what our goal is to avoid a, a catastrophic complication later and outcomes is to avoid intraoperative vitreous traction, prevent postoperative vitreous traction, and maintain a normal tensive globe as much as possible throughout the procedure. Uh, just because we broke a capsule doesn't mean that we need to have collateral damage of cornea, iris, or capsule. And I'm particularly uh, uh, anxious to recommend against relaxing capsule if we need to get something forward, then enlarge it uh, rather than uh, make cuts because the capsule can be so valuable to keep an implant in its perfect position later on. Uh, we're limiting the stage of complications, and I think it's our goal to leave a clean anterior segment, uh, not necessarily to deal with any lens material that uh, falls below the, the uh, into the posterior segment, uh, but rather to uh, do anything we can to get it out of the posterior uh, uh, chamber into the anterior chamber to remove it. And once it's there, at least in the U.S., at least where there's available retinal uh, three-port uh, three vitrectomy and lensectomy, I think it's imp important to leave it. Uh, our goal would be to implant preferably a stable acrylic lens, but better to leave it a fake it than to end up with a cloudy uh, uh, cornea that uh, where we can't follow the rest. Don't blink or you'll miss subtle signs. You'll see uh, in a moment the spidering of the back capsule despite protecting that capsule for the last fragment right there. And that tells us that the likelihood is we've ruptured our capsule. We need to not withdraw our fake our instrument but exchange the chopper. Don't blink or you'll miss subtle signs. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> typical cataract with a toric implant is going in an unremarkable manner. I'm uh, protecting the posterior capsule with my second hand instrument, supporting the chamber as I always do with BSS while removing the instruments from the eye. And that was fortunate because I now see a strangely clear area in the posterior capsule and on testing it, I see that this goat will drop right through, indicating that in fact I have a round punched out hole in the posterior capsule. 
Thinking fast, I'm using viscoelastic and the sulcus to flatten the anterior and posterior capsules to create a safe posterior capsular rexus. We must find a little tag or make one if necessary with a scissor so that we can make a true rexus uh, which finishes outside of where it begins. No matter how round your punched out hole will look, it is at risk for expanding with any pressure as it will not behave as a true created continuous rexus will. The vector force has to be more centripetal for this very thin elastic tissue, and uh, we will successfully complete this. That's much more difficult in the face of a ruptured anterior hyoid, uh, but fortunately we kept the chamber from collapsing on removing both the phaco and INA tips, and so the hyoid never broke in this case, permitting us to go on with a completely uncomplicated uh, case. Now that we've accomplished that, we can fill the bag and feel safe to place our toric implant. Uh, pressure on that posterior capsule will not extend the tear because we have a true rex. Keep in mind that we need this hole to be nicely tamponaded, uh, holding the lens back if necessary with a second instrument while removing viscoelastic and uh, placing myocol uh, in the eye uh, prior to uh, removing the instrument to allow uh, prevent any vitreous prolapse. This is amongst the saddest of situations, a routine, what ought to be a routine case, uh, but you'll see that the rise time and vacuum are too high for this uh, unpredicted, soft, myopic lens. I'm removing anterior cortex in the usual manner and planning a vertical chop technique as I just begin to start to come through the anterior nucleus. You'll see that tremendous change in pupil bounce and what happened was the material came sucking through the port bringing the posterior capsule up to the uh, phaco needle and we have a rupture. That tremendous change in anterior chamber depth and bounce and pupil size is a surefire sign of complication and you'll begin to see my adrenaline surge as I replace the chopper for a dispersive viscoelastic cannula and fill the anterior chamber with viscoelastic while holding my ground with the phaco tip in place to prevent uh, lowering the pressure and losing the chamber. Only now when we control the chamber can we come out, inspect, relax, and plan. Direct entry measured three and a half millimeters back to find the pars plana. Uh, Par perpendicular to the sclera. Make sure you see the point of the MBR blade uh, in the pupil to be sure you're through and through. This is an old 20 gauge, so it's slightly larger for the flat edge. Uh, and then always watch the port while uh, accomplishing this. We must have a plug or a, uh, a temporary tie suture and always suture this. We have to be sure there's no incarceration of vitreous. Next, uh, we're going to see uh, that uh, we're going to do a trocar uh, system insertion, and we're going to pull the conge so it's not coincident. We're going to go three and a half millimeters back, limbus parallel to make a scleral tunnel. The appropriate uh, angle is 30 degrees to the sclera, and then uh, enter completely. And you'll see that the uh, here it's a little extreme that the collar uh, pops back so that we're sure we have not uh, broken the ceiling or the floor of the scleral tunnel so that when we come out we can apply direct pressure and uh, it's uh, I'm told that it's preferable rather than the pressure that I've applied here to actually crush it with the tip of the trocar in order to be sure that there is no uh, incarceration of vitreous. This should seal uh, nicely without any pleb. Here we're going to uh, see that we can only apply the trocar when we know that we have a firm eye because you can see the kind of pressure it takes. And I'm showing this Miyake modified view that uh, Liliana Werner helped me with in order to uh, demonstrate the pressure and also to show in your mind's eye what's happening inside. And the pars plane, you can see how it tilted backwards because we had a really good scleral tunnel. And then when we bring the vitrector through the cannula, it comes through again. Now, this is a regular three port 
hysterectomy, and it's it's just um, uh, an endoscopic view of this 23 gauge incision that was made directly. And you'll be able to see that the reason that it's absolutely critical we have a scleral tunnel incision if we're not going to suture, uh, if we want to be transconjunctival, is that here in this complete vitrectomy, you can see the kind of gaping hole that is there, and we would be filling that with vitreous rather. This is an aphakic patient with a planned anterior chamber lens, and there's vitreous preoperatively in the anterior chamber, which we're identifying with washed kenalog. As we remove the cannula from the paracentesis, you can see the vitreous follow the gradient of low pressure. When we cut it at the incision site, there's no real traction. However, you can very visibly see why we don't recommend sweeping the incision any longer, because you can see the tremendous tractional forces that are occurring through the pupil with this maneuver. We've made a pars plana incision and we've inserted our bare vitrector needle through that incision and we're now placing a 23 gauge irrigating cannula through the paracentesis. Uh, we're going to begin cutting and in a moment you'll see uh, we're going to go down into foot position 3 where we activate vacuum and you'll begin to see the vitreous move. We're not being overly efficient and so we're putting the vacuum up just a little bit in order to uh, begin to get some movement and pretty soon you'll see the vitreous very efficiently come home to the posterior chamber. If we were doing this through the anterior chamber, we'd be allowing the gradient of pressure to be lower anteriorly than posteriorly, but here the low pressure is going to be posterior and so we can be very effective. This is a modified me doing an anterior vitrectomy. That's with a clear corneal incision. And despite the fact that I'm putting the vitrector through the rent in the posterior capsule, you can see that as much vitreous is coming forward from the vitreous body as what I am removing anteriorly. And as we withdraw, there's often a wisp to the incision, as you might see at the slit lamp the next day. Now we're going to intentionally break the capsule and plan a posterior incision through the pars plana. And and uh, Kenalog or tree essence is uh, uh, particulate identifying. And the moment we pull out with our other instrument, you can see that vitreous followed. And now we're going plana, still with irrigation anteriorly, but pars plana below. We've amputated uh, our anterior posterior attachments on when we go to sweep. So <clears throat> here's just uh, the preference of O-ring, <clears throat> which is why. Uh, one should never relax the anterior capsule and always pay attention to the size of your capsular excess. Here is just the standard anterior capture. This will not have any pigment dispersion, uh, although you need to watch them because once in a while they'll need a PI. We uh, uh, didn't have an intact anterior rexus, then I would make an intentional post eye capsulotomy capture as uh, as Dr. Vasavita showed you earlier in the case of the angle closure. So <clears throat> post-op care is so critical. Um, I believe that we should absolutely always use my is absolutely required, though off-label. It was my habit, if I knew I was going to deal with vitreous ahead of time, uh, to give one uh, prophylactic dose, PO, of uh, Avalox, which is moxifloxacin, in order to uh, cross the blood-brain barrier and have an MIC in the vitreous at the time of entering the eye. But otherwise, I would give one dose postoperatively. There's no real evidence that this is effective, but but uh, at least in my experience, anecdotally, I've never seen an endophthalmitis after breaking a capsule using that technique. We want to warn patients about floaters and educate them for retinal symptoms. I might add that there, uh, there's now a Zhang ring uh, uh, test which uh, is uh, through precision vision, which I have no uh, financial interest in. It's like an Amsler grid for the macula, but it actually is a piece of paper you can give your patient, and they can pick up a peripheral detachment. Uh, we want to prophylax and treat pressure spikes. Better to leave more OVD along in the in the eye, especially if. Uh, uh, it's not uh, helon 5, which I would never use in a complicated situation. Uh, and uh, prophylax then to be aggressive taking it out and allow vitreous to come forward again. Timely referral to a retinal surgeon for any retained nucleus and a good scleral indented retinal exam, especially if we're doing a one-port pars plana incision. We want to be sure that we don't have any tears around the port because of allowing any vitreous uh, herniation into the wound and then uh, postoperative traction and aggressive. 
process of anti-inflammatory measuring uh, management with CME. I think disclosure to patients is always important. So I thank you for your attention, and uh, I've uh, tried to collapse a two-hour course, which is my preference for the time of this subject, into this uh, small time. Thank you so much for the invitation, too. Thanks, Lisa. Well, you know, most of the uh, this is a question directed towards uh, Dr. Mahipal Sachdev. You know, most of the anterior segment surgeons who are doing phacoemulsification are not fully conversant with the posterior vitrectomy. Uh, Dr. Abhay has shown with his presentations that the posterior vitrectomy is a much better one, which doesn't cause the extension of the uh, posterior capsule rupture. But how do you think it is relevant for, a, for an anterior segment surgeon who is not into any posterior segment vitrectomies? Should he continue with the anterior or should he shift on to the posterior vitrectomy? Dr. Mahipal, sir. Well, uh, Rohit, uh, the question that you have asked is ideally uh, there are several studies and I think Abhay was a pioneer and uh, as uh, Dr. Lisa has also just shown, uh, for uh, a better clear up and for the rent to not extend, it is always better that you go ahead with a posterior approach. Uh, as also prophylactically, you can do that uh, like uh, I have been uh, showing in cases where uh, there are subluxation, etc. But obviously, in case an uh, anterior segment surgeon does not uh, have the proficiency and uh, it is better that you do not cause the, uh, uh, the complications by trying to do something that you do not know how to do, ideally, one should learn it. If a person is not able to learn it, you have to clear up the anterior uh, uh, chamber and the wound, etc. and the use of triamcelone uh, there. And also, uh, normally, when we, as uh, in our FACO machines, we have full function probes. Uh, so it is uh, still better to go on to a bimanual rather than a full function uh, anterior vitrectomy probe. So best is to switch on to posterior. Otherwise, if there is a small uh, uh, amount of uh, disturbance of the vitreous, you can actually tamponade the, uh, the posterior uh, capsular rupture and uh, with a good viscoelastic and then uh, go ahead and do the vitrectomy using a anterior segment vitrectomy and triamcelone. So that is something very, very, it's not that anterior, uh, anterior root vitrectomy is out, but uh, it is uh, definitely posterior is a uh, parse planar root is much better. So I think uh, depends on the surgeon's um, confidence levels. Uh, I, I would have to agree, and that's why we have skills transfer labs, and also um, there are wonderful uh, devices. Uh, I have no financial interest, but such as Stuart Stahl's uh, uh, simuli, which we've been using, uh, and I recommend that this is something that one practice before you're in the acute situation, of course. Good point. Thank you. Dr. Deepak, uh, you, your take on this? Are you there, Dr. Deepak Magur? I'm having trouble not I'm here. sharing my I'm screen. here. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Dr. Roy, I'm can, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Lisa, congratulations and thank you for teaching us uh, um, PCR management anterior vitrectomy for years now. We have attended your uh, courses, they're all wonderful. Uh, just to add to a comment with Dr. Uh, Rohit was asking like whether what to do with anterior vitrectomy through the anterior road. Uh, well, I think one point I would like to highlight here is that uh, maintaining a low bottle height uh, when you're trying to do an antivitrectomy is extremely critical because if you're not done a PCC still and if you already injected viscoelastic and you go in with an infusion which is 90 which you already kept for your FACO and if you go in with that, it is going to blow out the posterior capsule. It's going to enlarge the posterior capsule. So one way to prevent enlargement of posterior capsule uh, before doing a uh, Rexis PCC is would be to ensure that the dynamics in the antechamber are very well maintained. And for that, I think monitoring your bottle height is extremely critical. Get down the bottle height because uh, your dispersive OVD is still there. Then do remove the uh, uh, anterior vitreous and then do a CCC and then you can go ahead and implant the lens. Because if you don't do a PCC when you're implanting the lens, again, you're more likely to enlarge the PCC. I Thank think you. Dr. Deepak, your point is well taken. Uh, the only thing that I wish to say is that most of the new machines, the moment you switch on to the vitrectomy mode, they will automatically uh, bring down the bottle height. So uh, the new machines have already taken care of that. But uh, in case you have an older machine, 
uh, obviously you have to do and I, uh, I would 110% agree with what you have said that the dynamics need to change when you are doing a vitrectomy over what they were when you are doing an IE or a FACO. And I, I just like to uh, add, it's a very important part, but that you need the highest cut rate you can possibly get. I mean, there's so much more to discuss. Highest put, cut rate, the lowest if you have a peristaltic machine, just a, a low uh, a, uh, AFR, uh, 15 to 20. And then we want to balance our bottle or, or our infusion with our vacuum. So uh, I like to go tell people to have a panel set vacuum, go pedal to the metal, and then balance their vacuum so the eye is normotensive when you feel it. Uh, there's so much more to discuss on that, but it is very important to keep that eye uh, never becoming a prune. So if you pedal to the metal on your, on your uh, AVIT and the eye gets soft because your bottle's so low, that's bad too. So that balance has to be achieved. John, uh, your take on this? John Hart? John, are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. No, uh, Lisa did a fantastic job. Segment surgeon, for that matter. Yeah, I, I thought Lisa did a fantastic job. I think one of the things that, that we, we take home is, yeah, many anterior segment surgeons are not going to be comfortable uh, doing pars plane of vitrectomies. I think those days should be gone. I think we should learn to do them and learn them properly. Uh, again, there are a lot of skills transfers courses, and I think as much as possible, we should do those. It's so much easier to bring the vitreous back where it belongs than to try and cut it off so it falls back into the anterior chamber. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Vasavita has a beautiful video that shows that with a ball of yarn uh, from, I don't know what year that was, maybe 2017, uh, uh, AFCRS, something like that. Yeah, and I use that clip in my, uh, thanks to him, in my lectures all the time. And yeah. you will well, enlarge your, your, your opening. You, you, you miss the opportunity to convert to a capsulorexis if you go in an anterior approach. Even if you go through that incision, through the opening in the PCR, you will bring vitreous forward as, as well as back and always enlarge that capsule. Range. Can I have one comment? I think the goal for a cataract surgeon is not to prevent drop of the nucleus or salvaging where to put the IOL. The one first goal, as Lisa mentioned, prevent acute intraoperative vitreo retinal traction, injury to the interface. And that happens whenever vitreous prolapses or do vitrectomy, much more so when you do anterior vitrectomy compared to pars planus. So I think as John and uh, Lisa and everybody agrees, we need to learn. The cataract surgeon now has to change the mindset and somehow get in on top of this by attending courses and whatever. Yeah, I think that's the take home or in home message nowadays for all that matter. So PCR, what next? Now we have the prince of ophthalmology, Dr. Ashwin Agarwal, who would be talking about plan A to plan B. Over to Ashwin. Thank you so much, sir. But Prince, really, <laughs> I mean, I don't think I deserve those comments, but I will start my presentation. I hope my screen is uh, clear to everybody and I'm yes, audible yes. as well. Yes. Okay. So uh, I think the plan A to plan B was a concept which uh, Dr. Uh, Rohit was talking to me about and said, you know, we, sh we should teach people uh, how to do this. When they have problems on table, everybody panics and worries what to do and how to do it. So just taking them through the steps and what are the instruments that probably are required are is, is a very important element of this. So let's talk about plan A. Just to take uh, things into perspective, plan A over here basically is, I'm showing you plan A of what I do in subluxated cases because my case of plan B is also a subluxated case. So I'm just showing you what I do. After doing the Rexis, and I think Dr. Chi showed some beautiful videos, uh, I wish as Dr. Rohit said, I could do magical uh, wonders like that. But no, anyways, we're mere models. Uh, I use a paper clip hook, which was designed by Dr. Susan, and uh, wanted to just showcase this because this is not the actual video. I'll come to that. But what I'm doing here is stabilizing the uh, bag before I actually uh, start my FACO. 
and this is the paper clip hook which goes into the tunnel uh, like a gibbs chariot tunnel uh, under a flap and now the bag is pretty stable i always put a capsule tension ring because the equator is not stable over here and it always allows some amount of vitreous the capsular hooks as well as paper clip hook along with the uh, ctr really holds this whole uh, capsule at bay and pushes the vitreous behind and this allows the vitreous to come forward i'm able to complete my uh, faco as well as uh, irrigation aspiration over here and once this is done i'm pretty much placing the lens in uh, in the bag no issues and that paper clip hook is now not removed that's the only one that i really need in place and it's always going to be permanently stabilized over there i doesn't need to be coming out i use this mostly in uh, this is not my video which i'm going to show you today the video the, the presentation that i have in mind for you guys is this the instruments that you need if in case any of the steps before i showed you goes wrong and i'll show you that as well but these are the instruments that you need a basic vitrectomy setup with a 23 gauge needle glue dial marker a glue dial forceps trocar ac maintainer a three piece lens and fibrin glue or sutures a lot of times glue dial can be a misnomer you can put sutures no harm in it so here's the problem so i'm it's, it's the same type of case uh, where you have a subluxation I mean, it doesn't really show when you started off but the minute i put this needle in and all of us here would have faced this initially doesn't look like it's such a big issue but when you go inside this bag starts dangling a little bit so you want to really stabilize this after doing a capsular excess you really want to stabilize it i'm just taking it forward just for in interest of time i don't want there to be a delay i want to show you guys what really uh, to do if in case a problem like this arises so i'm doing my hydro dissection and i'm going through the motions as it is i'm also doing a hydro delineation so to ensure the cleavage is very clean and simple uh once i'm done with uh, once i'm removing it you can watch here very clearly what's happening i by accident and this can happen to anybody while doing oh and there we go so that's the problem so what what was happening is once the last piece came out i didn't pull my uh, faco probe out and i went for the epinuclear bowl uh, but that also pulled the bag in such a case try not to do that so that's step 1 but if in case it does happen and it can happen even in a normal wound a uh, normal case suture your wounds so step 1 is suture the wound then you place a trocar but this trocar is placed after you make some flaps because now the bag really can't be used so much so now i'm making my uh, i'm doing a peritomy and i'm making a trocar entry posterior or anterior depending on the case in the case before there were cortical matter as well as the bag so i really needed to make a posterior one owing to the fact that these pieces might actually fall down so after making my posterior trocar in this case i'm now doing the glue dial marker to make these marks and the flat uh, a 23 gauge needle 0.75 mm corneal incision on the uh, opposite uh, on the left because i'm a right hander now removing this so you really want to have a by uh approach uh, a double approach on a vitrectomy anterior vitrectomy which i'm trying to do uh pieces can fall down and that's why i have placed a posterior uh, trocar but in case that does do ha that does happen i have to also put a three piece uh, a fast planar vitrectomy and try and remove those pieces once this anterior vitrectomy is done i'm actually taking my three piece uh, intraocular lens externalizing one haptic ensuring that i handshake the second haptic one by one to the opposite side and once both the haptics are out i'm now placing this in into a gebor chariot tunnel by using a 26 gauge needle at the base of the flap again 26 gauge needle at the base of the flap so a small trick over here which i try to tell everybody is if you hold it parallel to the haptic it will turn up so always hold it uh, perpendicular or on the opposite side that way you will be able to turn that haptic down to the base of the flap and it will go smoothly into the tunnel so these are small tricks that really help in uh, these conditions pupil reconstruction can be using pilocarpin but you always have to wash that out once you're uh, if you are doing that in this case i didn't need to do a pupiloplasty but if this happens this is an optic capture uh, this can happen if in the, if that happens on table please be rest assured that case has to happen. will go in for an optic capture post operatively and that point of time there will be an iol tilt 
that will cause disruption in vision and you will have not the best result that you wanted. So probably do a pupilloplasty to be sure in these cases. Once this is done, you can close, remove the trocar, posterior or anterior, remove them, put a glue. You can put sutures in these cases as well, but I put glue in most of my cases because I pile up these cases at least four or five in a, uh, every OR visit before I can go ahead and do this. And in summary, I would say that suture the wounds, do a peritomy, place a trocar AC maintainer or a posterior one, uh, fashion out scleral flaps, sclerotomy, anterior vitrectomy, externalize the three-piece haptics, tuck them in the gibbous chariot tunnel, use a pupiloplasty if need be, and closing, and, and here is the post-op day three of the same patient. He was doing exceptionally well. And uh, one extra last point I wanted to add for everybody's viewing is we are also conducting a world webinar on 30th and 31st of this month. So please be there. It's going to be an extravaganza of two days, two hours a day. Don't miss it. Uh, Dr. Roth, you're muted. Thank, thank you, Dr. Ashwin, for an excellent talk, which took us for, in different stages right up to the end. Dr. Rajendra Prasad, uh, you have, what is your point of view whenever you have to shift from plan, plan A to plan B? Dr. Rajendra Prasad, are you there? It's muted, so, so you're muted. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, it was a beautiful presentation from Ashin and uh, uh, the way he dealt the first case uh, uh, was excellent. So what I would uh, uh, be a little different uh, in that situation, like uh, uh, especially as you said, the anterior and posterior retract me. So I, uh, what happens actually when you have a, uh, the capsular disruption of the PCR, uh, it's more important what which already have been said earlier, like uh, your traction of the vitreous, which is going to put on the retina has to be avoided. So that is the most important part. And uh, for that uh, matter, like your anterior vitrectomy uh, becomes more important because we uh, anterior segment surgeons, we go in for the anterior vitrectomy only. And in anterior vitrectomy, the best way to do the vitrectomy is to do a dry vitrectomy like where your aspiration rate is very, very low, your vacuum is low, and your flow is low, and, and you do the vitrectomy with, with a very controlled vitrectomy so that you don't put too much of traction on the vitreous. Doing the posterior vitrectomy would mean like you will be removing a large amount of the, the vitreous, which we actually don't need in these cases. So you need, you need a very partial and a very limited vitrectomy, which, which has to be just underneath the posterior capsule. And uh, that vitrectomy, uh, the limited vitrectomy is only possible with the entry vitrectomy. Uh, Dr. Namrata, uh, you have been doing glued IOLs or? Uh... So I think uh, that was a great presentation, Ashwin, and uh, you showed all the situations very well. We are uh, doing glued IOLs with just uh, one small modification, and that is instead of the scleral tunnel that we make, we actually, with the help of the crescent, dissect it out. So it's a it's a it's a larger, uh, in terms of width, it's a larger surface area as compared to the tunnel. And the advantage is that the, the, uh, the haptics of the lens just go inside that tunnel and kind of, you know, just abut it like that without having to actually direct it. But I think both ways uh, it can be done and uh, plan B always have to be kept in mind uh, whenever there is a, uh, whenever there's a untoward event. Uh, Dr. Ashwin, how do you take care of the with the glued IOLs about the tilt of the IOL? Yeah, so uh, I think that that's a very solid point. Tilt and centration, I think they both go hand in hand. The centration is not because of the flaps. I think the most important part of centration is the sclerotomy itself. So where do you place the sclerotomy has to be equal sided on both the sides. Don't go beyond one millimeter because that really is going to be uh, leaving you with a less haptic tuck 
So do not do that. Go closer. 0.75 to a millimeter is good enough. Uh, unlike the Yamane, where you go two millimeters uh, away, which is different. Uh, the second thing in, in the tilt is you really have to go. If you're going 0.75 on one side, you go uh, one millimeter on the other side, you will have some amount of tilt. So try to measure yourself before you actually do this. Measure that distance from the blue limbus and ensure that you enter the uh, skew that, that say, at that same point on both the sides. That's the measure to remove the tilt. The second reason the tilt happens, as I said on my video, was because of the iris. When the iris dilates and it reconstricts, that time the, the optic can get caught in this iris. At that point, it can cause a tilt on the <coughs> IOM. So to prevent that, you must do a pupil uh, pupilloplasty in those cases at a point where it is needed. Do not do more of it if not needed. Don't do. Uh, you, you need to do only in that side where it's needed. In pediatric patients, I've seen that you probably need to do it a little bit more, but try to restrict yourself to have least manipulation of the iris because that helps in post-operative dilatation of that same pupil. Thank you, Dr. Ashwin. I think now we will move on to none other than Naveen Rao, uh, who is who's assistant professor of ophthalmology in Boston. He's basically from Hyderabad. And uh, the best part is, which uh, you know, I just was going through it, that his grandfather too was an ophthalmologist. And he's doing fellowship training in corneal transplantation and complex interior segment surgery. Over to Dr. Naveen, please. Thank you, Dr. Rohit. Uh, enjoyed uh, the talk so far. So I'll be talking about the Yamane technique, which of course was developed by Shin Yamane. And I have no financial disclosures in that. Uh, there are uh, several pieces of equipment that you'll need, but specifically the thin-walled 30-gauge needle as well as low-temp cautery are important for this uh, technique. We developed this flanged haptic IOL diagram to just assist in coming up with a schematic for where to put the incisions. You'll need two paracentesis incisions on either side of the main incision, as well as an incision distally for the AC maintainer, unless you're using a posterior infusion cannula. And as I'll show in a subsequent slide, we're going to measure two millimeters back from the limbus on either side, as well as two millimeters counterclockwise to those marks for the insertion of the needles. I suggest doing a full parse plane of vitrectomy for these surgeries, especially in your early cases, because there is a lot of manipulation on the lens in the mid vitreous cavity. And so I feel anterior vitrectomy is likely not enough to avoid the kind of vitreous traction that the distinguished speakers earlier were already uh, describing. And for this, I like to work with a vitreo retinal surgeon, partly because the lens sometimes drops during manipulation. Now, all of the lenses that are used for this technique are off-label, but I recommend using lenses with PVDF haptics. They are sturdy, they're resilient, and they form consistent flanges. That includes the Zeiss CT Lucia lens, which currently has still limited availability over the last year due to an international shortage, the Santan X70 lens, which has limited availability outside Japan, and the Medenium Matrix Acrylic 401. That is not available in the United States, so I have not used that myself, but I believe that may be available in many countries where these other lenses may not be. PMMA haptics are much more likely to crimp, bend, and break off from the optic, and they form inconsistent flanges. I've used the Johnson & Johnson ZA9003 lens, and I know some, some colleagues internationally have used that extensively. Um, it's not ideal, in my opinion. It's not as strong as the PVDF haptic, but it can be used. I would not recommend using the AR40 or the LI61 AO lens for this type of procedure because those haptics break off much more easily from the optic, and they bend easily. Uh, they're fine lenses in general, just for this purpose, they're not as good. The needles that you'll need ideally are these thin walled 30 gauge needles, which you can get from this company TSK in Japan. Their outer diameter is the same as a 30 gauge needle, but the internal diameter is wider than the typical 30 gauge needle, so it becomes much easier to dock the haptics. If you use 27 gauge needles, as is sometimes done by many retinal specialists, the haptics are more likely to slip in or out from those intrascleral tracts, leading to hypotony. In terms of power selection, I like to use a constant of 118.4, and I aim for a minus a half a diopter, or some surgeons aim for Plano and use 119.0 for the A constant. Ultimately, the effective lens position depends on the white to white of this particular eye that you're operating on, and also how far behind the limbus you enter the vitreous cavity with the needle. The further back you are for the, from the limbus, the more posterior the optic will sit, and the more minus you should aim to compensate for this. Regarding haptic locations, it depends which eye. So for me, 
when I'm operating on a right eye, I like to sit superiorly and place the haptics horizontally. That helps me avoid uh, the cheek where sometimes a prominent uh, uh, cheek can make it difficult if you're sitting temporally. The ergonomics of where your arms are, where your hands are passing the needles, it's often easier to sit superiorly for right eyes. For left eyes, the opposite. If you're sitting superiorly, you'll tend to bump into the patient's nose. So I tend to sit temporally when I'm operating on a left eye and uh, therefore uh, can have easier ergonomics for the needle docking. When you're operating on large eyes with horizontal white to white over 12, consider sitting temporally so that the haptics can be oriented vertically where the white to white diameter is less. It's important to use a low temp cautery and not a high temp cautery, which can shorten the haptics too much too fast. And on these cases, I like to make a peripheral iridotomy to help decrease the chance of reverse pupillary block and Ogg syndrome. So now we'll see some videos here. I wanted to just show a one minute video of the normal technique and then we'll go over some complications videos and how to manage those complications. You see we're making some paracentesis incisions, a main incision, marking the limbus on either side, mark two millimeters back and two millimeters counterclockwise to those marks. I'm inserting the three piece lens with the leading haptic on the distal iris, the trailing haptic remaining outside the wound. The first needle is inserted and the haptic is docked with a micro grasping forceps. Then the second needle is inserted and the trailing haptic is docked I like to insert the trailing haptic through the main incision, but some insurgents like to put it onto the iris and then, um, and then reach in with a paracentesis. Once we've made the flanges, we nudge those back into the sclera. So now let's watch some more fun videos on how to fix the complications that result from this. First, stop the anticoagulation for two reasons. You can get bleeding inside the eye, as you just saw, or you can also get subconjunctival hemorrhage, especially when you make a stuttering needle pass. And those subconjunctivals can be really problematic for this case because you don't know where you're putting the needle in. So it's very difficult to achieve good centration. Often there's difficulty docking the first haptic, and it's a simple trick. Just rotate the lens clockwise slightly, and that allows the leading haptic to become more parallel with the needle. So it's much easier to dock. Once you've docked the first haptic, one common problem is difficulty now docking the second haptic. And so one way that you'll find this easier is to grab the, parallel, grab the haptic more parallel with the micro grasping forceps. And you can do that either through the main incision or through a paracentesis. The more parallel you can grasp the haptic, the more easily you'll be able to dock the second needle. Sometimes you have to make a new paracentesis. And so here you'll see I'm struggling by going through the main incision. It's coming in perpendicular to the needle then I reach in from my original paracentesis, which I made a little bit too far away from my main incision. And now the problem is I'm grabbing that trailing, grabbing the trailing haptic almost in a perpendicular way, but this time through the inner curve of the haptic. So by grabbing from the outer curvature of the haptic, it becomes much easier to grab it in a parallel fashion for docking. This video I've borrowed from my friend, Dr. Brian Kim, and he's developed the trailing haptic first technique in which the leading haptic is first externalized through a paracentesis, then the trailing haptic is docked, and the leading haptic is then docked. He has very nice videos showing that. And so one of the other common issues is that the first haptic can slip back into the eye before you have a chance to melt it. And so in these situations, you just have to repass the needle. Often you could do that through the same track that you initially made. And then you just externalize it one more time and uh, remelt it. So in these situations, often melting the second haptic, the one that comes out successfully and does not slip back in, can be helpful so that it does not, too, slip back into the eye. You're trying to achieve these mushroom-shaped flanges, ideally, and that's the easiest to do with these PVDF haptics. Now, what happens if the lens is decentered after it's already been externalized? In these situations, it's best to just redock. And what you'll have to do sometimes is pull the haptic back into the eye with a macro grasping forceps, pass the needle again, and then uh, redock it. Now here, another strategy is to make a small pyridomy over one of the haptics, and then externalize that, pull it out slightly, trim it, shorten it a bit, while still holding on with the forceps. You can again remelt it, and then push it back in. So notice when the haptic is nudged back in, the centration is much better now. Initially, it looked like it was pulled too far to one side, but once you've nudged it back in, you'll notice again here in this case that it centers quite nicely. Now, another strategy is to just melt one haptic further. Instead of trimming it, you can just melt it a little bit more. So here you'll see I'm going to grab on with a, a tying forceps, and then I'll just melt until I'm happy with the length of the haptic, and then I'll trim off that excess material and nudge the haptic back in so that the uh, centration can be very good.
again, it's important to really push firmly on that so it doesn't expose uh, under the conjunctiva. Sometimes, though, you'll have a situation where the IOL is both decentered and tilted. And in these situations, you just have to redock and trim the haptics. You can see here how tilted and decentered that lens is. So we have to shorten the haptics as well as make new needle passes so that the centration will be better. And here you'll see this is successful, although there is still some tilt because of how much the haptics needed to be shortened. So notice here how difficult it actually is to get that haptic out of its scleral tract. So for anyone who feels that these are easily slipping out, I think it's just a matter of making sure that you use this thin walled 30 gauge needle. Now sometimes despite your best efforts, the haptics will break. And in these situations, you really have no choice except to replace the lens. Although I have seen some really interesting videos of a haptic being transplanted from a fresh lens onto a, a lens that's already inside the eye. And I haven't tried that myself, but I think that it's an interesting concept. I think it's just easiest to replace the lens. The reason I say not to use the AR40 or the LI61 lenses are that the haptics on those lenses tend to break off much more easily than the other lenses in my experience. So when this happens, again, the only thing you can really do is just take out the lens, start over. Often when you do that, you can still make those needle passes through the original tracks rather than making multiple holes. And sometimes when it's all failing and you don't have the right lens, you just convert to a glued eye well technique. And here's another example of how easily the haptics can break off from the optic haptic junction. So with that, I just wanted to invite you all. I hope we'll be able to see many of you at uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology this year in Las Vegas, where Dr. Ashwin and I run the skill transfer session called No Capsule, No Problem, Intrascleral Haptic Fixation of IOLs, where all the delegates can learn the glued IOL and the Yamane technique. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you. It's my honor. Dr. Naveen, Dr. Naveen is there any way by which we can control the amount of flanging both the sides so that there is an equal flanging or shortening of the loop of the haptic. Because this yeah. is the only concern which I feel where we cannot control. Yeah. So I think one, uh, one variable that uh, will be easily controlled is when you have lenses that are made of PVDF haptics, they don't shorten unpredictably. They shorten very slightly. Uh, the haptic tends to melt more widely rather than melting along its length. Uh, another tip is when you hold on with the tying forceps onto the haptic, hold one millimeter back from the end of the haptic, one millimeter back, and then hold the cautery one millimeter away from the end of the haptic. By doing that, you can minimize the amount of conduction of heat. When you hold on one millimeter away, minimize the amount of conduction of heat further along the shaft of the haptic so that it only shortens about one millimeter at most, and it doesn't continue to shorten beyond that. Dr. Shiraz, are you uh, doing uh, Yamane or glue to IOL for that matter? Is he there? Or I think he had to go. Dr. Uh, Matthew? You have, you have to unmute yourself, uh, Shiraz. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I have to, I'm really impressed with all these videos that I've been watching. And myself, I use a combination of techniques. Uh, I, I have to say, I struggle with the second haptic quite often. And the nation of a, a Shariot and uh, and a variation of, uh, of the glued IOL technique, but I usually use a, a buckle suture to do it. Um, I, find, I, I do find that every case is quite unique and uh, thinking on my feet can be a little bit stressful. Fortunately, uh, but it's uh, very useful to, to watch these techniques and, and perhaps uh, learn further options uh, rather than what I've been doing so far. Maybe I'll accomplish it all in one go without having to use a combination there. Uh, Matteo, for that matter, in uh, Italy, what is your uh, proposed plan for these secondary IOLs or primary IOLs in such in certain conditions? Are you there, Matteo? Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, yes, you are on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 well. What is your uh, preferred method? Uh, you use Yamane technique or you use the glued IOL technique? Sorry. Uh, well, uh, no, I, I, I don't use the Yamane technique. I try to, uh, to improve I, uh, sclerofixation IOL with, with a glued technique like uh, Amara Garbal show uh, 
many, many, many times ago and uh, all uh, related all the, um, the different situation that planet. Yeah, thank you. Dr. G.S. Dhami, we are in uh, that part of the world where uh, iris claw lenses have been used. Uh, in your setup, in your center, you have a vitro retina set up along with it. What is your uh, preferred technique for such situations? Go ahead. Um, I saw excellent videos of Dr. Naveen. Uh, really marvelous. But uh, I like to know the panel's view regarding retrofixation of iris claw lens. We are very fond of it. It's a few second job. A good artisan's lens okay. after a good vitrectomy that's very well centering and no conflict. We are really doing that. Of course, we are the Yamnes technique and others, blue dials, but the easiest and the fastest way we can do is the retrofixation of the iris claw lens. Uh, over to Dr. Gaurav to take on from now. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Rohit, and uh, after that really interesting uh, presentation, uh, we have our next speaker, uh, Matteo Piovella, from uh, from the global capital of uh, fashion and design, Milan, and uh, he was elected president of the Italian uh, Ophthalmological Society, the SOI, uh, which represents almost 7,000 uh, Italian doctors. Italy has uh, gone through a lot in the last two, three months, and Milan has been in the news for lots of uh, other things and we are all learning from uh, Italy's experience here in India and preparing and uh, he has been uh, he has past experience uh, with almost 234 uh, instruction courses uh, to his credit in the American Academy the ACRS the ESCRS and he has uh, really improved uh, uh, how to make uh, life, life surgery programs uh, much safer having performed uh, surgery in almost 121 uh, life surgery demonstrations worldwide and uh, you know it's our uh, honor to have him with us uh, for this uh... Uh, very much for this nice presentation sorry but two minutes ago i have some technical tra problem and now i i am uh, i think to be ready uh, to do what what uh, i i really need well one second no so uh, i advance well this video presentation do you, do you try to perfect. Do you see my video? Yes, we can. Okay. Video okay. presentation. So, uh, uh, I, w I, I prefer. Uh, Amar told me that I have only uh, right five minutes, so I prefer to, to record a video and uh, I will make some comment uh, after that. This video presentation try to clarify that. Uh, capsulotomy is a superior than uh, uh, manual capsule rescue. This is my standard way to adopt septo in a very safe uh, and very repetitive way uh, where I have a, a perfect centered capsulotomy that avoid uh, uh, my, my standard normal complication rate. Uh, that uh, is uh, I have no problem in implanting the IOL because the resistance of the uh, uh, capsulotomy is uh, effective and uh, one more time, really, really nice. Now I would like to show uh, what could happen uh, to face a complication uh, that is uh, capsular radiatives due to poor quality of the cup assembly in a some some times ago, uh, the company has some trouble in this assembly, and uh, so uh, the nitylite ring was not perfectly set inside the cap, and so the the cap slotomy was not perfect. And uh, you can see that uh, when you remove uh, the cortex, is uh, 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 is possible to detect that there is a properly radial cleft. Radial cleft, normally we think that it's easy to manage, but sometimes there are some sudden uh, situations that provide sudden complications, especially when you are implanting the lens. So what I mean is that uh, with uh, specific attention, you can 
provide a perfect cleaning of a anterior and a posterior uh, um, uh, capsule bag. And when um, this uh, injector are not effective, there is a, 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 a not control opening on the lens that uh, unfortunately is uh, positioning on, on, on the edge of the radial clef and that uh, open totally the capsule before because in this uh, situation is important to provide, uh, you see the opening of a posterior capsule that is really evident and that is a nightmare. This is a, a toric IOL. And so I, I have to, uh, to apply a lot of difficulty to, to provide a, a perfect, uh, a, a, a normal comparable result after the surgery. So uh, this is to testify that um, uh, here, uh, you see, is uh, uh, with a new upgrade of a uh, of a tip, <coughs> everything is uh, perfectly done. But uh, I experienced a capsular radial tears uh, due <coughs> to poor natural capsular resistance. So resistance. So that is uh, after the cap the takeoff, and that is. Uh, at the point that uh, I have provided an opening, uh, anterior opening of a anterior capsule, and uh, one more time I provide a perfect uh, cleaning with a lot of attention, but uh, one more time here is mandatory to implant the IL over in, in the sulcus, uh, over the bag, and, uh, and then uh, uh, provide uh, uh, side by side uh, to positioning uh, the IOL inside the bag, uh, and that is uh, what uh, mm, what is necessary. What I mean is that uh, uh, mechanical uh, capsulotomy that could be performed with effective and cheaper, and uh, I like because uh, I can apply in intumation cataract or and one more time we need to uh, to, to provide a, a certain skill to to manage this uh, particular uh, situation and thank you very much uh, for your uh, uh, what i mean is that uh, uh, in my experience uh, mechanical capsulotomy is safer uh, if compared with Menor, I have a, a huge experience with uh, Abi Vasvada and many of the other speakers. But uh, if uh, we apply uh, cataract surgery not depending by uh, economical limitation, there is a fantastic technology that uh, decreases the number of a, um, of, a, of a complication rate. Do you remember that? Um, uh, the Royal College has a manifesto that tried to decrease 38% uh, of the opening of the posterior capsule. That means uh, that uh, this is uh, something hepatic and something that is a, a problem for every surgeon. I am feeling Th Thanks, uh, Matthew, and for a wonderful presentation. So, George, I think before you doze off, um, I wanted to <laughs> ask you whether uh, what's your favorite? Is it the Femto or the Zepto? and uh, any take on that. And would you be happy to put uh, plate haptic uh, lenses when you have a suspect uh, PC? Oh, sorry, the broken uh, uh, rexus or a broken capsule. To unmute yourself. George, we can't hear you. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, so you asked me whether it's uh, my favorite technique, whether using the Zepto or the Femto. It's like asking me, do you beat your wife often, yes or no? Um, I don't use either one of those. I use That's uh, why the question. Yeah. my fingers. Um, so I do a manual capsular rexus. Um, you know, I have an idea of what size I want, and, 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 and I do that. So I don't use either device. I don't think it's all that important to have that. And I haven't seen any data that shows having a perfect capsular rexus. So um, that's to answer your first question. Your second question about plate haptic lenses. Um, I think if you have you know, a PCR and you've converted that to a uh, posterior capsular rexus and you have a secure um, capsulotomy edge, 
then I don't think there's any problem with putting a plate haptic lens into the bag and making sure that it's secure. So I think, you know, I, I rarely use plate haptic lenses, but if um, I had a PCR and I had a good capsule rexis, I still would continue to use it. I think the problem is in Canada is that most of the plate haptic lenses are hydrophilic uh, in nature. And you always have to consider that if you're putting that in and the patient ends up having a retinal detachment and gas being used, that that hydrophilic lens may opacify. So I think that always has to be in the back of your mind uh, with a PCR and a hydrophilic lens. Thanks, Josh. I'll take a quick comment from Josh and then from Dr. Namrata. Yeah. Yeah, no, my, my, I, I have... I, first of all, there was a beautiful, beautiful video. These have all been wonderful videos. Um, I have a, 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 a question that's sort of a, a motif for, for all of these. Obviously, none of us wants a, a lens with any degree of uh, tilt. But how much tilt is actually clinically relevant? Um, Matt, would you like to answer that? Eight no. degrees. Well... I, I, in my experience, I, I, for example, uh, now I, I, I am implanting more than 90% trifocal eye oil in my cataract patient, and uh, I, 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 very, I, I don't remember to have uh, some problem about the tilting of the eye oil. So, and uh, I have implant, and uh, I am implanting this eye oil also after posterior capsule opening. I have been planting also this lens in the sulcus. And so uh, I think that this is uh, uh, dedicated to some cases that uh, is uh, the surgeon after complication or with the difficulties has no the opportunity to take care of the tilting. But uh, if, you, if you try to manage it at the end of the cases, because you need to, to apply something positive, I don't think that is really significant. Also, I think that also decentration is uh, not so effective as uh, many many colleagues uh, 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 explain. Or maybe a manual. And as far as the plate haptic is concerned, I think I would be a little uh, wary of putting plate haptic with the... With the... Uh, Gaurav, the only thing I want to tell the audience or what, uh, see in case there is a PCR and you have to place it on the sulcus and uh, as uh, Dr. Payawala was saying that uh, he does all trifocals, there is obviously going to be a change in the power that you need to implant. Uh, so that uh, definitely has to be taken into account and I would, uh, I would as Dr. Namrata said, I would not do it uh, uh, plate lens in a sulcus but if you are doing a toric plate lens, uh, uh, that will be an absolute, absolute contraindication in the sulcus because it is not made for the sulcus and there is a, a strong possibility of a rotation of the lens, uh, especially if it's a toric uh, trifocal or a plain toric. So in any case, I would prefer to go in for a three-piece. I would agree with George that in case there is no vitreous disturbance and you have a posterior capsular axis, which is uh, pretty neat and clean, then possibly you can uh, think of uh, putting in a plate lens. But uh, I have my reservations of uh, uh, putting in uh, uh, a plate lens in the sulcus. But toric, absolutely, I think uh, we should not go with the impression that we can put a toric plate lens in the sulcus and change the power. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Maipal, and uh, thanks everyone for all your uh, good comments and thanks for the wonderful presentation, uh, Dr. Pivala. Uh, since we are running behind time, I'll uh, you know request our I'll introduce our next speaker. Uh, at, that's uh, Dr. Tushy Om Prakash uh, from Amritsar. He's a bright young man with great ideas. Uh, he's uh, been doing excellent work, uh, showing us excellent surgeries, new techniques. He's been publishing, and uh, I'm sure he's going to show us some new stuff uh, today, which is going to stand out. Tushy. Thank you for such kind words, Dr. Gaurav. So uh, today I'll be talking on uh, different case scenarios of posterior polar cataract with pre-existing posterior capsule rupture. I have no financial disclosures. So I'll be discussing two cases. One is posterior polar cataract with pre-existing PCR and no nucleosclerosis, a patient who was 32 years old, and another patient who was 55 years old with the PPC with pre-existing PCR in nucleosclerosis of grade two to three.
I'll be showing you by step by step approach. So I started my case with a primary incision made 90 degree to the PCR axis. Side port incision was made, which was relatively small, which prevented leakage and also helped in providing stability during the surgery. Plan was to make a oval rexus. Oval rexus was made 90 degree to the axis of the PCR, which prevented any stress on the PCR. The oval rexus had numerous advantages. The large arm of the rexus helped <coughs> In providing no rise of intracapsular pressure, safe end-to-end -end sculpting, easy division, easy sub-incisional cortex removal, and smooth IOL implantation. The smaller arm of the rexus helped in easy IOL capture, nucleus piece retention in the bag, and helped in tamponading of the vitreous. Coming to the high, so when we have a PPC case with nucleus sclerosis of grade two to three, no hydro procedures were done. Coming back to the case with no nucleus sclerosis, layer by layer, hydrodelineation was done. Simulating facts, flax. BSS was injected at different planes to ensure complete nuclear epinuclear separation. Multiple layer phaco aspiration was done. Slow motion phaco emulsification was followed. Safe phaco emulsification techniques with low IOP at no point nucleus was rotated. As the layers were aspirated by the phaco probe, the outer corticonuclear layer provided a shield to the PCR. With the aid of the chopper, the outer nuclear layer was dislodged and aspirated. It was made sure that the capsular bag was not overinflated at any point of time. Coming to the case with nucleus sclerosis of grade two to three, no hydro procedures were done. My plan was to do stop and chop technique. Safe phaco emulsification techniques were followed with low IOP. Slow motion phaco, sculpting was done slowly. It was made sure that the two nuclear hemispheres have divided completely. At no point the nucleus was rotated Cross chopping was done, wherein the nuclear pieces adjacent to six o'clock position was divided and emulsified. The nuclear hemisphere was taken out and emulsified slowly. I kept continuing phaco emulsification as I was sure that the hyaloid phase was intact, as there was no peaking of the pupil and I couldn't see any vitreous in the AC. At the last, the other nuclear hemisphere was taken out and it was emulsified. So before taking out the probe, the bag was inflated with viscoelastics. The remaining cortex was aspirated with a coaxial IA a bimanual IA or, a, or dry aspiration could have is also a good option. The vitreous prolapse or vitreous hydration was prevented by two important steps. First, high sleeve retraction of the coaxial IA. This helped in separating the level of irrigation and aspiration, simulating a bimanual IA. The cortical lamellae were slowly taken, dislodged without aspirating the epinucleus because this epinucleus Help in, helped in shielding the PCR. So once the cortical lamella were, were freed from all the points, then only the epinucleus was aspirated quickly. So before taking out the probe, viscoelastic was again injected. It was made sure not to overinflate the bag. From the side port, a micro rexus forceps was used where the posterior capsular rent was converted into a posterior rexus, a regular posterior capsular rexus.
bitterness was a certain there was absence of bitterness with the tamsin on in the ac multi piece iol was injected into the sulcus and the short arm of the rexes was used to capture the iol by following all these steps i could have a good centered iol and a good post operative best class visual equity of 2020 thank you so much thanks uh, to chef for those wonderful uh, presentations and uh, i'll take this opportunity to ask uh, lisa to please dr abhishek please uh, comment on this can you unmute yourself yes yes, yes. i just did yes um i i a beautiful surgery and i think it it involves some of the concepts that abhay vasavada has shown us with the uh, multiple planes as you mentioned in femto uh i one thing that i want to mention that i think is so helpful in this and poster polar cataracts where we don't even know how fragile that capsule is as you mentioned we don't want to deepen the chamber or shallow the chamber and so if you go in at the very beginning uh with uh, uh with a little ovd uh, between the iris and the anterior capsule particularly in a myopic patient go in under ovd control on foot position 0 lift the iris and then go to foot position 1 then you'll never get that uh retro pulsion of the iris that occurs with posterior block with reverse pupillary block in the myop or the patient with poor zonules and so you can assure that you don't over deepen the chamber uh which will easily happen and that's the end of the 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 case already you know on a myop or uh uh someone just with very lax zonules so it's just one little detail uh you handled that beautifully and i think it makes so much sense and the only question is whether uh at that point that you finished everything perfectly and you've completed the posterior capsule rexus whether you want to put it in the bag and then optic capture into burger space uh in order to uh totally hermetically seal that uh anterior hyoid from the front of the eye then you can be more elaborate in removing your ovd anteriorly uh but once you have it captured in either anterior or posterior or both you're really in good shape so i congratulate you on a beautiful measured approach and that's the only thing little tiny detail i would add so you don't over deep in any eye when you go in for position 0 lift rather than just resolve thanks uh, dr abhi sir i'll take uh, john uh, here and ask him that how often or you know tushesh showed very nicely how to convert the you know pre existing break into a continuous uh, rexus how often would you be able to do that in a posterior polar cataract with you know a break in the posterior capsule is it uh, easy or difficult and some pearls on that uh, john um when i do a posterior polar cataract for the most part i leave the posterior capsule alone I I think that's something that I will deal with with the ag capsulotomy later for the most part. Uh I again this is a beautiful case and and things went absolutely well. Um just a a, a couple of things come up. Um, I think the underlying theme of this entire conference is let's keep this a closed system. Let's keep the pressure normal in the anterior segment. Every single case that we've seen goes back to that. And it's that that's really really critical and and how this case was managed so well. Um I I think once we get away from that is when we have problems. And we didn't talk about that because all the cases went well. But I think that is the underlying issue here. Keep normal pressure in the anterior segment. It keeps the vitreous back. it keeps everything up in the front and it makes life a whole lot better. Uh so beautiful case. The one thing I would add uh when making uh any of these capsular rexus, I've seen people talking about an oval capsular rexus. I still like to make my capsular rexus round and smaller than my optic so that not when i do optic capture i also get a nice barrier separating the anterior segment from the vitreous cavity if i have an oval opening i'm a little bit careful that i'm not going to be able to maintain that and that could be a source for vitreous coming around but beautiful case fantastic case thanks john uh, you know uh, we have a panel of uh, you know a lot of experienced surgeons is there anybody on the panel who would be willing to do a femto assisted surgery with a posterior polar cataract with a break in the posterior capsule 
Yeah. Yes. Is there anybody who would want to? Partha? Partha, oh, yes. Uh, want to say as well. can, I, can I quickly make two comments? Uh, one is uh, excellent uh, surgical demonstration, Tushar. Really, congratulations for this. Uh, one comment that I would really like to make is uh, your making of that posterior capsular rexis with a PPC and a rip, which was transverse, converting that into a posterior capsular rexis is very, very difficult. And you could do it because it did not digress right up to the equator. And it were, you had the edges in view. So you were lucky, but the expertise was excellent, number one. Number two, we also did see Dr. Lisa's video in which she made a capsular rexis out of a, a posterior capsular rupture, but she made it through the main port with, uh, with a forceps uh, that was the utrata forceps. So I think your technique means I would go by your technique um, by placing the micro rexis, micro forceps from the side port, which gives a more anterior chamber, um, a, a more stable anterior chamber, and there's less digress of the viscoelastic from the anterior chamber. So I think uh, this uh, definitely is, uh, these are two small things. That wonderful I tips, Partha. And uh, Namrata, quick one that you wanted to add. I just uh, wanted to add, and I think uh, Dr. Vasavada has also published the same, just a modification of that. When we do femto cataract, we actually have three cylinders, two, four, and six millimeters, and have three chops, six millimeters in length. And then block by block, we just, you know, eat up those things. But of course, if you have a posterior capsular end, then you have to, you know, offset it a little bit more anteriorly because you can't go through and through. And also, the energy uh, might have to be played yeah, with a little yeah, bit more. Yeah. Not the energy, but you have to just offset the I know, offset, and you know, maybe I would also go with the technique which uses less energy so that less cavitation bubble, I mean, bubbles as well. So, great points, Amrita. And we cannot finish this without taking a word from Dr. Vasavada, who's the master of posterior polar cataracts. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I think I will uh, recognize the teaching of Dr. Osher in this entire topic, but I would suggest uh, mechanical hydro in, inside out delineation if you're not doing a femto i would prefer femto but but mechanical inside out would uh, reduce the chance of inver inadvertent uh, subcapsular hydro dissection but tushya you did a great job and beautiful cases wonderful Thanks, uh, Dr. Vasavara, and thanks, Tushya, for those wonderful videos and wonderful tips. I think take-home messages are great. And that uh, leads us to, you know, uh, our next presenter and uh, none other than Dr. Shiraz there from the UK. And he's, uh, it's my privilege to introduce him, uh, dear friend, director and consultant, corneoplastic unit and eye bank Queen Victoria Hospital, East Winstead, and he's the medical director of Center for Sight uh, all the way since uh, 1994. And uh, more than 50, 115 publications in peer reviewed journals. He's been there on the PAR list of ophthalmologists 2018 19. We keep enjoying all his presentations. He's dynamic and a uh, lot of new stuff that I keep learning from him in both uh, cataract and refractive. So, uh, you know, it's my privilege to have him uh, speak here. Uh, please go ahead, Shiraz. Well, thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Definitely, yes. 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 Uh, I wonder which one it is. Um, you can go to the presentation. I mean, switch on the slideshow. Are you on now? Can you yes, see now, the slideshow? Now it's, it's good now, yes. Do you, do you have the full screen, do you? Yes, yes, thanks. Great. Well, thank you very, very much for inviting me to participate. I feel like a bit of a fraud here because I'm going to be talking about high technologies and, and trying to avoid troubles by using these. Um, these are my financial declarations. I, I am on the medical monitor from Barshalam. And I'm also involved with excellence in the capsule uh, laser. I'm going to be talking a little bit about two techniques, well, one is second laser, and the other is capsule laser as well, which uh, is, uses a, a dye staining on the capsule and performs a, a, a capsule rotomy. And we call this selective laser capsule rotomy. The, the, this is the capsule laser. And you can see, this is just to illustrate this, it's even faster now, it just be a second, and now I can do a capsule lot of it in, in 0.33 seconds. And that's it there. So that's, that has quite a few advantages, um, which I'll, I shall uh, discuss in a moment. But what we did find, this is in collaboration with, with Sunfik Chi, is, uh, I've, I expect she's gone to bed now, um, that we, we demonstrated the, that uh, bigger capsules 
in this sort of range are, are, are stronger, and discontinuous capsules are actually weaker. And a further study which compared uh, selective laser capsulotomy with manual capsulorexis and flax. And what we found is that, in contrast to some other studies, the capsule, capsule laser, selective laser capsulotomy was stronger than manual uh, uh, capsulorexis, which in turn was stronger than flax. So although I, I'm really 100% a uh, flax surgeon, and uh, now doing more, uh, some uh, uh, SLC, um, it, it is weaker, but I, say I, do, I do enjoy using um, uh, uh, the femtosecond laser. And I think one of, the, one of the things is that the fragmentation is probably underestimated in terms of its value. So why is SLC stronger than CCC and flax? And if you do take a look at the SEMs here, you'll see that this is probably the reason why the, 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 the capsule laser the capsule falls over in itself and it becomes like a double capsule. And there's also some uh, amorphous change in the, in the college which makes it a bit stronger. This is a, a manual capsule which I'm sure you've seen. And this is a, a decent SEM of um, a, a, a femtosecond laser uh, uh, capsule autonomy. And we published this not so long ago uh, uh, in terms of comparison. So with flags, what can go wrong? We can get loss of suction, you can get anterior radial tears, skips, tags and you can get a loss of lens posteriorly. And this is a, a, a publication by, by Roberts uh, and, and company showing, uh, demonstrating that two of their, the, uh, out of the 51st uh, uh, cases had posterior capsule rupture and lens loss after hydrodissection. And I found something similar. This is Miyaki talking about capsule block syndrome. Well, you know, there's a, the three stages to this. You can inject uh, a, a fluid, you'll get distension of the posterior capsule. This is in hydrodissection. If you're too vigorous, you get, the lens can come forward and, and widen the anterior capsule, and then it can eventually can break the posterior capsule. And this is kind of what happens in, in terms of like laser cataract surgery, where at, the, where at this area here, you get what's, what's probably a fusion of cortex to the anterior capsule. And when I did this myself, this is one of my first cases, here I'm doing the conventional hydrodissection. You'll see the, the anterior capsule widening. And that was kind of scary, and everything was quite stiff and solid. I had to rock the lens to release the fluid there. I decided I was going to do that anymore. And so what I used to do was uh, try and take out, uh, uh, break up the lens. Um, so this is, this is an animation showing what exactly happens here. You've got inject fluid, and you'll see, yes, the, the hydrodissects. But it gets sealed and it keeps going, keeps sustaining the posterior capsule. So what we did is we abandoned this, and I, what I used to do is break the lens up uh, and, and use a shoehorn technique to take out each uh, quadrant, and that was kind of a laborious thing to be doing. And one day when I was doing this, I decided to use a, a cannula to do this. This is a cannula we use for hydrodissection. Um, I'm just taking that capsule out there, and you'll see me injecting fluid uh, by mistake. So I'm going in. I'm going into the into into the fragmentation. Then, by mistake, I inject the fluid, and that that hydrodissected the lens. I said, "Wow, that, you know, is that by mistake? Well, maybe I should try and do that by design." So I did, and it seemed to work very well. They would spin that. You can see that lens is spinning beautifully inside the capsular bag, and um, we went on to develop a hydrodissection cannula with with uh, Barshalon, and this is translenticular hydrodissection in action here. So what we do is we, we use this, it looks a bit like a fake of chopper, but it's got a, it's a really a cannula, and then we go into the, into the fragmentation, inject fluid, you can see that, that bubble displaced to the side there, and then we can rock that lens and it rotates beautifully. And that makes the, 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 the lens loosening much easier, we can even use that chopper to break up the lens and do it like a pre-chop further to get uh, the fragments out. And this is an animation illustrating the same thing here. So why, why do we manage to hydrodissect without distending the capsule? Well, that's because any excess fluid goes right out where the, where the cannula is, and that avoids breakage. And we, we found that, the, that doing femto certainly reduced f effective FACO time uh, statistically significantly, and translens compared to without translens uh, reduced it uh, a further. And this we published a, a while ago. This is, a, some of the, this is just a cortical cleavage to help irrigate our cortex and make it a lot easier to remove during femtosecond laser cataract surgery. And it makes the whole process very, very rapid. So at the time in the eye is a lot less using some of these little maneuvers that are, 
that deviate a little bit from conventional cataract surgery. Now, this is a case of a patient who had cataract post pass plane of vitrectomy, but he had dense, almost, what was it? it was a brown, brunescent leather cataract. And um, I couldn't see, I couldn't, you know, all I could see was a, was a brown lens there. And he'd waited for about two years before he decided to come and see us. He'd been done in the United States and he was traveling through the UK. Uh, I took a look at him and said, yeah, I can do your surgery. And I went ahead. Um, and you can see this is, this is uh, after doing flax, I could see the lens descending before I even bothered to do anything. And um, that was it. He went into the back of the eye. I called up my retina guy, uh, Tom Williamson. I said, what do, you, what do you think I should do? Should I just leave him for you to deal with? And do you want me to put a lens in? He said, no, I'll put a lens in. It'll save me the trouble of, of opening his incision again. And uh, hopefully he won't have any retinal tears or anything. We won't have to put any gas in. So that's what I did. And, and when I look, took a look at his video again to see what I did wrong, I, what I didn't notice was this. So the, that, the online OCT on Plax can be quite useful sometimes if you take a look at this. So if, now actually what I do now is every patient who's had a pass band of vitrectomy that has a cataract, I will dilate them and image the posterior capsule and, and, and also take a look at it if I can see through it as far as I can. And often they have white cataracts or they're very dense nuclear sclerotic cataracts. That's something to be aware of. This, these are Tom's own uh, results in 13, uh, in almost 1,400 pass band of vitrectomies. He admitted to lens touch in 3.7, and when he did cataract surgery in those patients, these are fake um, vitrectomies, 11% had a posterior capsule rupture. So that's quite significant. In ones that there was no lens touch after fast plane of vitrectomy, the, the rate was 1.4%. So retinal surgeons often touch the, the lens, and that's something to be aware of. Um, this is a white intumescent cataract that I did, uh, well, actually it was white, white cataract in a young, in a young chap who's about 34 years old, and I didn't, see, I didn't see him for six months, and he came in to have cataract surgery, and I was doing flax on him. And I didn't realize he was actually that intumescent until I saw this OCT, and this is his video. Um, you'll see that you know, we, we've talked about flax being useful in intumescent cataracts, but that's really not necessarily the case. Let me just accelerate this a little bit in the interest of time. So you can see what, what I've done here is I've, got, I've gone ahead, and you can see this, this white cloud going across on all on one side. And that's fluid leaking out. Now, the first second cataract surgeons will tell you this. If you've got any opacity, it starts to interfere with, with further ablation. Now, I was worried that this was cut on one. Maybe I was going to have an Argentinian flag type situation. So I abandoned the surgery, and I took him to the operating table and took a look. I'm just doing his limb relaxing incision for good measure here. I had to abandon the surgery, so I couldn't do it with the, the femto. And um, I put this cloud of material inside the eye. So I put some tripan blue in. Well, I've got the option. Not sure it's going to do much with that, all that material in the eye. And then I, I drained out all that liquid and cortical material. I realized he actually had an anterior plaque there as well. And I had a, a superior opening from the femto. So yeah, I'm, I'm just aspirating. His, as I said, he was a young guy. And I just irrigated, aspirated his cataract. You see that anterior plaque there that, that was already been discussed in the symposium. Well, that was, that was achieved without any uh, radial tears. Um, the, as you can see, the, the tripan blue didn't stain the capsule very much. And here I'm injecting in a trifocal lens. I got to go around the edge there. And once that was accomplished, then I did an anterior capsulotomy and completed it. So I was kind of relieved that that happened. And that sort of made me wonder what, how I should approach these patients in the future. And um, Really, the, the, the best option is probably to do a double anterior capsulotomy with flax, a small one, and then followed by a big one, and making sure that the, the ring, uh, 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 this ring um, scan is absolutely flat as possible when doing the procedure. This is another case of a high hyperope. A 44-year-old who was plus 15 diopters of refraction. She had a very shallow anterior chamber. She required a 42 diopter lens. So I'm going to do this using capsule laser with a trifocal and a piggyback monofocal. And this is what happened now. You know, hyperopes, uh, as we all know, are, can, can be quite hazardous. This is capsule laser in, in place, uh, in play, one of my earlier cases. So uh, we stain up this capsule with a very, very concentrated solution of tripan blue. And this is the, uh, a very, very abbreviated video showing the capsulotomy taking place.
And then go ahead and we take out the cap seal. Let me move this on a bit. And I go ahead and FACO and manage to accomplish all this. And then I, I take that FACO and I can see that ovalization of that capsule. Now that's not from capsule data. You take a closer look, you see the zonules all dehissed over there. So putting some, some, cap, uh, some viscoelastic in the capsule bag and using a CTR to brace it. And that seems to have helped. I've got to now go ahead and I'm injecting in the, the trifocal lens. Physiol micro F. And I have need to extend the wound a little bit. I'm using this, the soft port, 20 out to lens, and injecting that into the sockets. You see that the edge of the capsulotomy with the capsule laser is quite intensely blue. So it, it visualizes well, and it's also very, very strong. And so here, I'm, once I've got this in place, I'm just going to do this anterior lens capture, optic capture. So both lenses are in the bag, but the anterior ones and the, the haptics are in the sulcus. And that's uh, the, the value of something like capsule is giving you good visualization and a strong capsule edge. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, Shiraz. That was brilliant. Uh, so that brings me to a question for you. Uh, we saw Dr. Piovella show us uh, some zepto assisted surgeries, and you worked with the femtosecond laser and now with the capsule laser. And with that really nice intumescent cataract mm -hmm. where that cloud can sometimes impede the laser mm -hmm. from reaching the capsule, even though some of the new lasers have the you know, capsule lot me over in less than a second, and uh, you know, uh, you can uh, the catalyst uh, for, for that reason is my preferred uh, machine. Yet, I have a question that uh, you know, the capsule laser to build that get impeded as well if you had a you know, real intumescent cataract, which would suddenly break because how fast is the capsule laser in finishing off the capsule lot? Do you think it could still have tags? And do you think Zepto may be a better technique because Zepto edges are also very strong? You know, they, they are really strong, uh, somewhat yeah. like what you showed on the capsule laser. Well, but well, I, uh, if you can do this in, 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 a, in a third of a second, I think that you're pretty much okay. Um, and uh, I've not done any yet. Uh, I, I was sent some videos of ones that have been done. And, but I've not seen any escape because they, they, the viscoelastic that's used with capsule lasers is very heavy and exerts quite a lot of pressure on the capsule. So there's not much release of fluid. I don't, I don't know if those particular videos had enough um, fluid in them, if they were in tumescent and morganion or not. But they didn't, it didn't seem to do much, but it, they certainly accomplished um, a, a capsule. I mean, this is uh, uh, Jorge Alio's video and also Pavel Stavilka from Czech. Um, they both have done organic cataracts with capsule with very good success. Yeah, thanks. So Dr. Piavala wants to comment, yes. Yeah, well, I think that um, uh, what the Sharad show was outstanding, but it's very clear. We don't need to take care the resistances uh, of a different cap, of the capsule with different uh, device, because uh, if it should be not effective, we can't adopt that, because uh, it's practical. I, what I need is something that uh, uh, do not uh, create a radial cleft when I perform the surgery. And obviously, if you apply this technology, the Zepto, the laser, uh, the Stodulka laser, or the Fento laser, it, it means that works. It's, it's not important, this is strength, this is less, uh, and, is, uh, and then the technology that we adopt was not ready. Everybody knows the, the laser that was shown for the first three years was not effective, has a lot of problems. It takes one hour to perform a, 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 a surgery. So now the world is totally different. And also when we speak about uh, PCO after diffractive technology implantation, in my practice since eight years, we apply capsule, YAG laser capsulotomy in 100% of the patient within one year, because if you don't manage that, the patient lost near vision. And, and, and so it's not effective and you can't spread the technology to the majority of your patient because it's a practical feedback that need to, to take the line. So another thing, if everybody understand that it's not possible to implant a multifocal IOL after an opening of the posterior capsule and uh, that this lens is not possible to put in the sulcus. This means that we have uh, no practical experience in that. So 
vice versa, if you apply that in, a, in a 10, in 20, 25 patients, and you can get the result, you understand that we have no the right sizes of the IOLs because it optic in the sulcus can be the truth better rotated, but it's more easy better rotate a, a slope IOL because slope IOL has also the reverse flexibility when you are implanting the back for about the axis. So uh, these are uh, news. These are something that we, uh, we need to provide experience. And uh, I think that Sharas understand and agree with me that uh, when he adopt a technology, it takes a lot of time and, and nobody has to discuss about that. Thanks, uh, Dr. Pivel. I think we got the message. And, uh, you know, I really just and also to put a jet of uh, fluid for the hydrodissection into the groove. Uh, would you uh, care to comment on that, Dr. Chi? Yeah, I know. Um, before Sharas uh, had done that many cases, he shared that with me. Uh, but honestly, I hardly hydro decide my femto cases. I do, you know, femto in many, many cases. And um, I find that you hardly need any fluid because of the gas bubble. So... Yeah. You more dissection. Yes, exactly. And, you know, if I have complex cases, like I do posterior polar, I just do visco dissection just up to the equator and I stop there and only in the subincisional areas. And, you know, which means that you don't have to rotate even the routine cataract. So that really makes things so much safer and it's uh, faster also because you, you save one step. Thanks, Dr. Chi. I think I agree with that. And uh, I think uh, we'll take a quick comment from Dr. Naveen. Uh, he, if he would like to comment on uh, the capsule laser, do you have, uh, I don't think in the US you have, uh, is it commercially available yet? Uh, and what is it your... Is commercially, it is commercially, the CMR is commercially available outside the United States. Sorry, Naveen. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. A lot <laughs> of things I wish we had. <laughs> Naveen, uh, do you prefer the Femto or the Zepto or you have probably access to both of those? What's your preferred technique? Yeah, I, I've used uh, Femto uh, in the past. I, I just found it uh, a little prone to various glitches because personally, I just don't use it very often. So for me, I, I uh, primarily use manual techniques. Wonderful. I yeah. think I'll pass on to Dr. Rohit to take quick yeah. comments from all our panelists before we close. I think we've exceeded time. Thank you yeah. for giving me this opportunity. You know, one, one question which has been cropping up is uh, mainly with uh, Dr. Vasavra sir's uh, this thing. So one question from... Uh, uh, Ravi, Dr. Ravi Bora is, what change in IOL power you do here in comparison to in the bag calculation? Number one, so how much astigmatism you come across in such cases? Will you do trifocals in such cases? I would add, uh, make it half a diopter myopic. I do not see that it can induce astigmatism. And I do not use multifocal lens because I use three-piece IOL and I don't have any um, three-piece designed uh, trifocal lens with me. Yeah. So I half think, a diopter more. I think we have uh, overshot time. And uh, mm -hmm. I would like to thank Dr. Amar Agarwal for uh, the opportunity which he has given uh, through IRSI to conduct this webinar. All talks were top of the line, and I think it was take-home message messages right across the all the talks were there to be taken in home this time, not a by home, whatever you want to call it. Like, and with this, I would like to thank all the foreign faculty who took time out on the Sunday to be there up in the morning to be with us. But we have, you know audience right across Latin America and, you know, uh, Australia, Africa, even South Africa, who have come in. And uh, thank you again very much for being there, each one of you, because without you, it would not have been possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Roy. You did a Many wonderful thanks. job. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Lucera Gavro. Great. Thanks, Great thanks, job. Thanks, thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, you know, making it such a lively discussion. And, and, and you need to thank Dr. Chi for staying up late, not getting <laughs> 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 right? part was missed. Sorry. Superb surgery. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.